and I'm sure it is for you, we get an opportunity to share in this amazing level of knowledge of Earth's mysteries and really cracking into the greatest levels of spiritual awareness. Now, as I mentioned this evening, it is a powerful build. So before I get started, I need to set a couple things up. Uh, so that way and we're I'm able sure to, there we go, boom, boom. And uh, we're sharing this with the world and we're in residence. It's Friday over here in Costa Rica. It's seven o'clock. Of course, for those that are tuning in, you know, this is Tri Vibes. The actual heading of tonight's build is Masters of the Waveform. Now, let me just again, let me take a moment to breathe because I'm already ready to take off. You know how I do. It's two minutes in. We're going to go ahead and get this mixed up around the around the cosmos by asking you to chime in and let us know where you're at. Send your wholeness across the space. And if you can acknowledge the person that was before you, if you have your Palo Santo and your sage, this is the best time. There's actually a disclaimer on today's build that says adepts only. So this means that the energy that will be moving through, you just wanted to move it through. And uh, whatever works for you works. And then whatever doesn't for this moment, this resonance, this vibration, this frequency, then go ahead and let it pass through you. And uh, so Palo Santo and Sage is in order. If you don't know what that is, then you have some research for yourself to do. And then you have a little event that you may go ahead and uh, uh, in, uh, embark on tomorrow or whenever, preferably before next Friday. So what we're going to do is we're going to send this wholeness. My name is Seven Bomar. I'm in Costa Rica, wholeness and balanced vibrations tribe. Let's go ahead and send that energy around the cosmos and get ready to get to it. <laughs> oh, nice family. This is Billy from LA. At Sean's house. Honest. Honest family, we out here. Honest Sean, Honest yeah. Billy. This is Rukia in St. Louis. Honest Rukia, this is C Pan in Ithaca, New York. Honest family. Honest C Pan, this is Jody from Australia. Honest tribe. Wholeness Jody, this is Cassandra from Aurora, Colorado, Wholeness Tribe. Love you all. Wholeness, Wholeness Cassandra, this is Willie in Fort Collins, Colorado. Wholeness, Wholeness. <laughs> wholeness family, Wholeness Willie, this is Ashley in Dallas, Texas. Sending y'all so much love. Wholeness Ashley, this is Gabrielle from Orangeburg, South Carolina, Wholeness Tribe. Wholeness Gabrielle, this is Tori in Chicago, Wholeness. Wholeness Tori in Chicago, this is Anne in San Diego, Wholeness family. Wholeness, Wholeness, this is Chaka from the Azores. Wholeness Chaka, this is Adamo, Ontario, Canada, Wholeness fan. Wholeness Adamo, this is Nelson from Columbus, Ohio. Wholeness family, blessings. My name is Shay from California, close to Sacramento, and so happy to be here. Let's go, let's go. Don't be shy, don't be shy. Wholeness family, this is Seclinda and our youngest adept joining us tonight in this tribe, Hassan, docked in Oklahoma. Wholeness. Wholeness. Wholeness Seclinda, this is Tony from New Jersey. Wholeness, Tony. This is Chris from Boston. Let's go. Wholeness, Chris from Boston. This is Kwanda in Nashville. Wholeness tribe. Wholeness, 
Onus Kwanda. This is Dominic. Claudia. New York. Who is Dominic? This is Supreme. We got Anton with me. You know, I want to send the Hoonas and Balance vibrations to everybody and Seven and everybody else. Let's get this thing rolling. Good to see y'all. Let's get it. We got three minutes. Hold this tribe. This is Michelle in Michigan right now. Good to see everybody. Honest, Michelle. This is Abby in Florida. Honest, everybody. Honest, Abby. This is Frederick in Chicago. Honest, Trap. Honest, Frederick. This is Tears from St. Petersburg. Honest, Trap. What's up, my guy? It's good. It's good. We're ready. We're ready. All right, now it's almost a hundred of us on the line. Actually, it's a uh, fifty-six. So I guess we're filling up the boat. All right, so we're gonna take off in two minutes, regardless. I'm giving this opportunity and this time for everyone to connect in. This is a vibrational frequency that is so unique. You really have the opportunity to really see yourself. <laughs> the reflections are vast. And so if you have something to say at this space and time in infinity, I suggest you do it, homeless. Homeless tribe, this is Doreen from Australia. Homeless, everyone. Homeless tribes, keeping keeping the shining lights above the sky out of Georgia. Yeah, we in Jersey right now. So um, yeah, I'm just I'm just super pumped up, y'all. I'm super pumped up. Um, every Friday night, I just look forward to being with the tribe again and just staying in that whole frequency, this whole zone, and you know, once again, creating. I had to do this over because. The uh, camera was facing the other side, and I want everybody to see it. So, you know, just sending that wholeness and balance by preparation again. And I encourage everybody to go to go and say something, y'all. So, oh, man, the energy is crazy. But, yeah, wholeness, y'all, once again. <laughs> wholeness, folks from Georgia. Uh, wholeness, wholeness, wholeness. Oh, sorry, I got stuck here, but I'm from somewhere and I'm Diana and I'm here, so. Owners Diana, this is Chris in St. Louis. Owners Tribe. Owners Chris from St. Louis, this is Elsa in Israel. Owners Elsa. <laughs> Holness Elsa, Holness everyone, <laughs> Val in Memphis. Holness love y'all. Holness uh, Valencia, Tim coming in from Aotearoa, the pre colonial name of New Zealand. And yeah, pleasure to be in this place with y'all. Boom. Holness tribe, this is Lariani from Pennsylvania. Honest Laliani, this is Slim from Nashville, Tennessee. Honest Tribe. Honest Slims, man, you've been coming through this week strong. Giving so much love. Coming from Texas, this is Sammy. Honest Sammy, brother, feeling the love, sending it right back at you. Hold 
Wellness family, this is Jessica from Texas. Wellness Jessica, this is Lucas in upstate New York. Okay. Okay, there we are. Wow, family, thank you so much for taking the time and the opportunity to be in the space. This is, uh, it's like forever in a day. It's, we exist infinitely. I remember being here just like us the first day with that same level of passion, if not more. And even at this stage of greater clarity. And that clarity is something that I would like to share with you. I would like for sure for you to be as a part of this tribe on the strongest foundation, rooted and actually ready to continually continue your meteoric rise into greatness. And I wanted to also start off today by putting a bit of a disclaimer on today's build because it for sure is um, a depth level because I'm looking to draw some conclusions here and actually lay a foundation so we can move forward. And because of that, it means that we need to recap on the high points of what we've learned so far and what we've come to know to be the truth. Uh, and because of that, you know, some of the topics that we're going to dive into are definitely going to be adept or adult. So I will say that, you know, if, if you brought the kids along and, you know, you thought the animated character was going to come out, <laughs> this may not be the evening. Um, and then also you always have the opportunity to catch the archive just in being mindful about that. But we do have to have these, these builds from time to time because we're for sure expanding. There's synchronicities way beyond the limits. I see things happening and I know things. Uh, I've experienced things. And what it does is, is every day, it allows me to live in a world in a totally different perception than maybe someone else. And to see this reality and to see it very clearly is actually to really get into it, to actually really begin to, uh, to enjoy the exploration that can take place uh, because you found yourself here in this space but you would have to at least know where you're at and actually what you're in. And that's what I mean by drawing conclusions. You know how, you know, it's like there's this speculative nature to some of the things that we've heard. We've heard about light bodies. We've heard about other worlds. We've heard about different beings. We've heard about codes within the language. We've heard a lot of things, but there's always that moment of and point of introspection where you have to ask yourself, do you really believe that though? Do you really believe this stuff that you're hearing? And the only way that you can truly get the correct answer when you ask yourself that is to really see if you're doing something different than what you were doing before you found out that news. So very clearly, if you say that you truly believe in many of the things that we're actually experiencing uh, now, even from the occult level, uh, let's say you come into this knowledge two, three years ago, 10 years ago about something massive, how much did that actually change who you were at that stage? Because as an example, if I find out that I won the lottery or something like that, then you're gonna see this change of behavior over the next two weeks where I, you know, all of a sudden I'm gonna be, yeah, let's go you know i'll be you know sending money to all my folks going out places you know for me it'd probably be building a, a, a smart city uh based on um etheric connection to the all there is you know but again it's like there's a change because you found out something and you know that that something is true so hopefully i'm very clear i've discussed this in the past before but i just wanted to make sure there was a preface to this and it's that if, if you truly believe in this, it should really change the way that you see things, the way that you act. You should be able to even check yourself sometime when you see yourself just going into this this loop de loop with the same, you know, emotional left brain, right brain scenario rather than staying in the center of your consciousness. And then you should be able to start having this conversation. So it's almost like you create 
a, a character for yourself that is like an arbitrator or a mediator. So when you're doing something super left brain, super right brain, and you know, it's just this pattern that you keep finding yourself in, you do have to come in on yourself and create or not necessarily create, but reactivate that neutral zone inside of yourself and say, hey, you know, what's up? I mean, didn't you already know getting mad drains your energy? So, so why are you getting mad? Like, what are we doing here? Like, help me help you. So that way you can start expanding. But that's that check and balance system that you're going to have to have with yourself. So I hope tonight to fully initiate that for you, uh, this awareness where you can go forward and every single thing that you see going around on around you, it's almost like you don't even see it because you already know what it is. You see beyond it. We went through a very powerful build last Tri Vibes, and I dropped some amazing gems. Again, just about the setup of the consciousness and how there could literally be like um, like a whisper in each ear. Uh, it's called, you know, the the good angel or the bad angel, and. It's very interesting to come to this point today because it's every bit of this awareness of what these two voices or what these two modes of your consciousness truly are. And that is the one that will actually do something for the sheer pleasure of it, right? And then the other one that is a lot more calculated about the scenario and actually wants to always practice some level of discretion and purity about the next engagement. And uh, also the extremes of these two natures where one could literally destroy others in the act of purity, meaning let's purify everybody and let's get rid of everybody that's not pure, kill them all, and think that that's good, while you know the other one could be headlong in, in self-destructive destruction and, and not even care and just work with that level of distortion. And those are the two hemispheres of the mind in many ways. And the opportunity, because those those two hemispheres, what we, you know, I'm not going to elaborate on the whole bill here, you have an opportunity to take a look at it, but those two hemispheres respectively are opposites. And this is what actually allows us to generate. You'd have to know that the real gods, they don't need anything from you. There would have been nothing that they needed from you per se and created you for to do specifically for them that you could be able to control. I want to make that very specific. It wouldn't be like, oh, well, I either do what the gods, the real gods, if you may, we're just using words here. I, I'm either going to do what the real gods want me to do or I'm not. Kind of like how the Bible is set up. What we are doing just sheerly by living and interacting with each other is we are turning the wheel. Just by our thinking alone, our thoughts become the memories that fill up the chasm in an infinite abyss that cannot be measured its depth or its height. So we've created this lattice work, this matrix, if you may, some call it the matrix, that is like a flying carpet. It is an embroidered tapestry of all of our engagements, and we are flying on this thing in the middle of nothing. And so how you add to that carpet is just being. And that's all that was requested by the most highest, most original sources. And so they're not, they're not going to put that choice in your hands and not going to put that choice in anybody's hands because that's preservation. So when we move from there, which I call after the decimal point, oh my goodness, everything you can think of will go on because it is akin to a pie. Phi, it is also akin to rule number 30 in mathematics. And that is simply, this is also, let me show rule number 30 real quick here. In mathematics, rule number 30 basically is showing that the patterns that are exhibited within nature are, when mapped out in mathematics, equal an infinite, never repeating design. And this is how you get all of these different animals, all these different insects, all of these different personalities. You get lots of stuff. So because of that, when you're trying to determine even what's going to happen next and who's on top and who's the biggest, who's the baddest, who that's all going to be a matter of perspective. So as observers, what we do is we pull back off of the entire thing and we look at it and we just look for the pattern, the fractal, what we call the blueprint, the algorithm. Because if we're inside of it, then at best, we should just be enjoying it, having the experiences of infinitely something new, 
This will be spelled in you, always dazzling you in front of your eyes, literally an energy that can keep changing and, and tug all of, uh, all of the, the receptors that you've gained so far, all the systems of resonance and perception that you've gained so far, it can enchant that and, 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 and plug into that and explore that with you. That's existence and that's creation. So you can imagine in, in anything can happen just where some folks can end up. And so out of the out of the grace of this creation, there are many of us that function like, as I mentioned, tow trucks on the astral plane, that when someone kind of crashes out in the party, gets too sick, maybe even dies, pass out, whatever, someone's still got to come through because this is an infinite existence and actually get them shaped up and fashioned up and formed up for another level of a round of this amazing level of creation where just like in certain video games, you die, you blink like a ghost for a minute where you can pass through a few walls and then you start getting static again and here we go again. So, you know, hopefully you learn where all the warp zones are so you can get to level eight as fast as possible. But that is the actual existence. So on this journey, we have each other and I want to be here for you so that you remain encouraged on this journey. So again, foundations are set by drawing conclusions. And in this whole thing with consciousness, spiritual consciousness, et cetera, it could get so airy that some folks haven't really drawn any conclusions yet. So maybe you're not actually really seeing any change with them. Maybe you're not actually seeing any change within yourself. This would be directly the reason why. So I've, I've identified in the past with myself as like, well, if you really believe that, though, like you, you would be selling all of this. If, if you really believe that, though, you have stopped eating that. If you really believe that, though, you'd be running up out of here. So it's like you don't really believe it. And so if you don't believe it, you definitely don't know it. Belief is the initiation. Let's get used to this. Let's see what we're even talking about. Knowing is becoming completely familiar with it getting it to a level of mastery. As they say, you're like, I put in over 10,000 hours on this. So for me personally, that's also really my endeavor is to keep creating foundations for myself and then moving on from those, moving on from those foundations. It's like a, a rocket ship needs a launch pad. <laughs> the launch pad is actually the most important thing because we do plan on landing right <laughs> Some folks, they just plan on takeoff. And I've been in that stage too. You know, you're just trying to figure out how to activate, let alone deactivate. You thought, I've never deactivated again. <laughs> you know, stay activated too long and all your, your ventricle systems and your, your lymphatic system is burning up from all the power that you're, is running through your body. You will want to like, okay, let's, let's chill out for a moment. And then you go to sleep for a long time and regenerate all your body. So this is a thing where you want to take off, but you also want to land. They, I kind of forgot to include that in the ascension directions. It's like you take off first, like, yo, you need to learn how to land and engage landing gear. Okay. And then, you know, for sure there will be a crash at some point. And these crashes, they cr we, we could crash hard because we not only, you know, get just back to ground zero when we crash, we actually have an impact that seems to take us even down into the netherworld. So anyone who's actually fallen off the crown chakra before, you know, it's like, just like work it out. You could just fall off sometimes on the crown chakra and just stop doing everything that you know, and then almost like hit the ground and then go even deeper than in the darkness than you were when you first started the ascent process, right? So that's just, that's all a part of it. And, you know, our goals have always been to really just lay that out. Like the map is not the terrain itself. So even if we assist people with knowing, hey, this is what's going to happen at certain stages, at least they could prepare themselves in some way, but it still wouldn't take away that they actually had to go through the experience. So, you know, what we're doing here at Secret Energy is something special. Also, as you see here and as you have seen, we have an entire tribe across the world right now. We have accomplished unification. While everybody's beefing on their own little preference in the prism, here we are actually highlighting the majority, which is that, but we all are really breathing the same air and living in the same space. 
And even the same dream worlds are starting to overlap. So maybe we want to actually come in together instead of fighting all the time and seeing who's better all the time and getting mad at each other all the time. But I'm actually going to explain where all that energy is coming from, though, because that is actually the same energy that actually fuels the matrix and actually fuels the yin yang flow or the energetic moving of this boat. So without further ado, Okay, give me one quick second here. Let me see if I need to adjust some screens here. Give me one second. Okay, somebody's demanding big screen. I guess it's, I guess finally, you know, Zoom leaves no help docs on what they be doing. So when I see gallery, because I like to ride out with all of us then everybody sees gallery. And uh, so I'm going to put it into uh, spotlight view and that should help those that are actually on YouTube actually see the spotlight. And of course, anybody here on Zoom, you can actually hit the spotlight button. You know, even, you know, just taking this break for a moment, I do want to let you know if you're on the other side of things and you have not joined Sovereign Team Mentorship, this would be the perfect time to jump in. We've actually given everybody a coupon code for Fortress where you get $25 off the first month of Sovereign Team Mentorship so you can dive in and check it out. There's 26 courses there. That's hundreds of hours of the perfection of the metaphysical blueprint. And we put the cherry on top with the four elements. And what that's allowed you to be able to do is actually dive in and get exactly what you need since there is so much. Okay, so with that being said, I'm going to continue to move into this. I trust that on the YouTube side, my picture is big. And uh, so here it is, the greatest teacher. So without further ado, 12 years of consistent occultism in, pub in the public space. Like I've been doing this all my life, but I can say for, for the record with everybody else to bear witness, this is 12 years and why I'm aware of this. I got all the pictures like, man, I was looking at my metaphysical occult albums and images that I've been collecting for 12 years, also as a computer engineer. So I know how to use the internet and man, it's vast. Like anything that I say, I can actually prove over and over and over and over again, not just one picture. And man, an ode to just, I mean, Guy TV, you know, as a sidebar, please stop. <laughs> like whatever, whatever is going on where the people are shooting the media out there, they are so off and lost to what the what a real cultism is. You just know that that agenda to keep misleading people is in full effect. But you got to know personally that if you're here today, that you have a certain level of resonance, a guide that actually really is interested in you knowing the truth. And I can tell you that these guides, when you have one, a guide like that, it's not going to desist. It's not going to give up on you. It's already been way too long for it shaping, molding and fashioning you into what you what people are now calling a God, what people are calling a higher level or a supreme being. That is actually what. The, the real ancestors are doing with us. The college, as was mentioned, is invisible because the greatest teachers across the cosmos can teach you without you know, knowing you're being taught. I'll say that again. The greatest teachers can teach you without you knowing you're even being taught. And that's almost a riddle in itself because it explains that these teachers are basically invisible. You will go through an entire process. We used to call it the occultation and just be there, you know, by yourself thinking that just you that's engaging and initiating all these synchronicities. But meanwhile, it's just a prerequisite that while you're going through your development, that there's not too much visual external influence. That's funny. It's not so much as that there's not too much influence because the air is influencing you. The water is influencing you. There's a lot of influence, but not a non-visual influence. I mean, you're not going to see this angel sitting in the corner in the room like, all right, you, you, I'm getting ready to project your whole dream tonight. You ready? Yeah, we ready, angel. You know, that that's just going to totally kill the experience. That's what I was saying. It's like, it's not in our parents' interest to do it all for you. That's a life. You get your own life. You got to do it actually yourself. And in that process, though, they're going to assist you in doing it because that's what parents do. So. 
again, that's why I'm like, I'm, I'm just letting this breathe because I already know the power behind or in, in front of what exactly is coming through. And I'm just like, okay, let me see how much of the wake has to move through in order for the technical difficulties move out of the way. In fact, let me open up my, my servers here one second and, and increase the bandwidth. And so I'm gonna keep going. So the first thing I'm gonna answer for you really briefly, because y'all know, like I've always been on my, my show titles. It's like, I guess that's the reason why I have a low amount of subscribers because the titles of my show be like, Cold Woman Omen in the Universal Mother. And they're like, nobody Googles for that. <laughs> so, you know, tonight it is Masters of the Waveform. So someone may say, what is a Master of the Waveform? And I will say tonight, the most important thing that you would need to realize about them is that to, to manipulate or master the waveform is actually to be able to change how things are perceived by others, by onlookers, okay? I think I remember one time in Heroes, there was this one dude, the, the heavy set dude, and his power was he could just cr grab people, right? And then he could like get into another reality or whatever. So when people would come in, they would not even see him and whoever he was enveloping with this, with this perception, or actually he was also even changing the perception of everybody that was in that room so that they wouldn't actually see them there. So this is master of a waveform type of stuff. It's actually, it gets into more and I'm going to explain it in detail here, but it's about being able to actually change the reality and the perception of what others are perceiving from the said reality that they're actually looking at. So this is very similar to right now inside of, uh, obviously we now have the onset of the metaverse and we have virtual reality, we have video games. This is very similar to when you're going, or even books, those were the first ones that when you go into a reality that has been created, you start to try to gain a level of perception. You even kind of immerse yourself into that, that space. So the best books, you've been able to completely immerse yourself in Little House on the Prairie. I'm not sure, but it, the, the way that the author is continuously representing uh, uh, the, the scene. Also, you got to notice through time, the stimulus levels would change, you know, uh, what became uh, immersive perception for you. For some books, I remember books for me and still today is like, man, I just get totally immersed. But for others, when they look at books, it's like, oh, boring. And then for some, you know, they get into this video game and it's like they're there. They're like Star Captain R on Planet Zulon. And, you know, they even dress it like it. They go down, go down to Vegas with the costume and everything. And it's just like it's a total immersion. But certain people immerse, different people immerse differently. But as society as a whole, Society is always working on its next projection of immersion. And as you know, right now, the TVs and things are our number one conduit of immersive content. So again, a manipulator of the waveform through time as an ancient being is always concerned about link things like language, symbolism, things like light, electricity, things like liquid crystal, all that, the stuff that actually uh, determines perception. Now let's go to the ancient times first here. And let's just give a quick example of this perception. Okay. Just from the deepest core, most esoteric, because I can bring it all the way back up from here. So here's what I mean by symbolism and perception all the way down to the T. So the map of Idrisil which is in the occult Norse tradition, which is the actual, the Druids that were uh, actually in where you're calling the Owl of um, Britain or Albion, right? So the Albino, right? So in, in, in their tradition of the Norse, they have the Idrisil as a map to the cosmos and a map to the world and the, also a map to the netherworld. And that is a perfect emulation of also the eye, because since all of this that we're in, as I was explaining before, it, it's all holographic in many ways. It's all uh, redundant, if you may. So it's you're in a universe, you're a universe inside of a universe, inside of a universe. And even the smallest parts of you are micro universes within themselves. And 
the expression of the universe, so let's say with the eye, is going to contain all of the expressions of the worlds because the eye, with being the gateway to the soul, is the end of the tube in which one comes through in order to perceive a world. So again, when you're coming out of your mother's womb, it's like you're, everything is tubes. You're coming down a tube. Sound is through tubes. Even the, 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 uh, the, the masculine uh, uh, organ is a tube. So here you are always moving through these tubes. And again, when you finally terminate that into today, you even have the TV, which is also a tube. It is, it's an eye. It's a cathode ray tube. Because in our eye, in that area that you're seeing right below the white area, is actually, um, it looks like hexagons. They're actually, it's like a hex hexagonal meshing. You can actually see it when you look at uh, up close imagery of the eye, a microscopic imagery of the eye. So we're actually seeing through a hexagram right now with our real eyes. So when even the external cloned things are created like the TV, then it's still gonna abide by those same principles because that principle is a dialectic. That principle is why as above, so below, meaning that the principle itself, once you realize it, it actually works on anything. And that's really the whole of mastery of, 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 of massive levels of, 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 of spiritual power even, is because you start having what's called a unwavering faith. And it's really based on that. You know that there's no way that what you're doing can not work because you're using the same principles in which the original architects, builders, creators, originators, whatever you want to call them today, used to put all this in play and continuously use that. Like, it's interesting because, you know, we, we look at the creators and we act like they're like long gone and dead. It's like, yeah, our creators, the ancestors. And then we're like, they're long gone. Really, they're like so far ahead. And we're like, you know, we're in their wake. You see what I mean? Like we're just, you're, we're selling on the waves coming from their boat. So, you know, changing the perception of like, yo, but we're infinite and de so we're infinite, it's definitely they're infinite. And so it's not like they're not there and they're not in the space, but who are they? Okay. And I have a statement in relation to that. And it's offspring is like its parent and contains its parent, but isn't its parent. It's always that paradoxical thing with earth. It's like, <laughs> yes and no. As even us, like my child, right? She is me, she is her mother, and she is herself. So when we're thinking about like the ancestors and the ancients, this is actually really where the difference comes in between what you may call human and humanoid. Because back in the day, the word that was being used for human actually meant to description of many beings that look totally different than us. But the thing that they had in common with us is that they could actually reason. They weren't completely tied into the instinctual nature that is also inside of the reality. There's like a hard coded firmware of the reality where things that are below a certain octave or frequency, they live exactly, they, they live on instinct. And instinct is a pre-program from, from the time it comes out of this little egg and doesn't even have a development, it already knows what to do because that's already a wavelength, if you may, actually moving across that it's tuned into. While the humanoid is actually able to tune into multiple frequencies or also block other frequencies. So this allows them to do what's called reason, like which is basically to be able to, to guide the boat to be able to determine where you want to go, and in effect, basically be, to be able to change your destiny. So if anyone says it's impossible to change your destiny, welcome to the impossible. We're doing it all the time. Something came from nothing. That's called impossible. So this impossible thing, we, we are into doing it, and we know how to do it, and uh, we're going to continue with it. So even if you're, you're sitting over there right now, you're thinking it's impossible for me to actually understand what this guy is saying, stick with it, <laughs> stick with it because eventually it's just all gonna click. So remember then that this perception of human and humanoid is a lot more vast in the astral plane than it actually is in our current levels of perception. Our current levels of perception is likened unto what they call, it's like a, a cast which is a mold. So someone is cast a spell, but it's a mold. 
And what this mold is, is the physical bodies. And the physical bodies that we're using now are over the top of another framework that cannot be seen. Because remember, our masters of the waveform control how things look. So one of, the, one of the goals here recently, and I say recently because it's been trillions of years, but one of the goals recently has been to reduce the amount of conflict and quarreling by actually making the beings look more similar to each other. So this is very simple to understand. It's like when you go in nature, there are, there are beings there that are diametrically opposed to each other. They, one's predator, the other one is prey. However, if they looked identical to each other and were also close to the same size, then they would actually probably not see, not, not have the predator and prey thing going on. So even in, in history, when the more different we looked, the more conflicts actually occurred. Now, you can also see these conflicts as being the, the, by, uh, the preliminary uh, uh, stage of integration. Meaning that generally when a conqueror comes, it then integrates with whatever it conquered. And then you get an offspring of the conqueror and the, conquer the conqueror and the conquered in the same body, which actually still would lead to certain levels of conflict. So many of us are actually, or all of us, excuse me, <laughs> you'll see that very clearly, are blended with two opposite poles that normally are in conflict with each other. But because we are created as supreme beings, we've been created with the neutral area. Whether we use it or not is another thing. But we've been created with a, new, a, a neutral zone, an Eve angel, if you may, a messiah is what they would call it, inside of our consciousness that belongs to us, that allows us to begin to basically play not only the role of the judge, but also the role of the God or the Godhead. So very clearly, We've seen how, just as an example, the masters of the waveform will maneuver symbolism, but still allow it to be replete to every single aspect of how the blueprint functions. However, there's another phenomena that I wanted to mention before we begin, and that's that new words are created to, when new words are created to explain the same thing, it becomes the child of that thing and it changes, okay? Now, this is just one that cannot be looked over as a master scholar, especially in the context of spiritual awareness, etymology, et cetera. When the name of something changes, the name itself can add on additional parts that actually almost create a chimera of what it was before. So it's the same thing that would happen if when you birth a child, now it still has its own uniqueness too. So it's gonna come out a bit different. So that's how languages, especially words of power work. That anytime there's a new word created to start trying to try to explain the same thing and we're not using the same ancient word anymore, there becomes a metamorphosis of that word. And so thus the energy metamorphosis. So it becomes like the child of that energy. And that's what can make things so confusing. And another good example of that, just to you know, recap here, is how we saw Shukra, which is the being all the way on the left, also known these days as Venus, which is actually, again, some type of reptilian mammalian mother goddess, morph to a size, I guess that's about a size four, size five, and then completely have a sex change and leave from a very pleasant paradise looking place to what clearly looks destitute and barren all within a few hundred years. So we get Shukra, then Venus, then Lucifer. And all of those words are used to explain the same thing. But as you can see clearly, when the new words are created, they take on somewhat of a different form and there's a metamorphosis. So they can be seen to be children or offspring of those original energies. Now, what's interesting is, is that someone could try to come in and say, well, no, they're not a part of that family. They're not a part of that bloodline. And, and none of that actually makes any sense since we're all needing each other. And I'm going to explain that very clearly here, that even this word need is actually K-N-E-A-D, which actually refers to what you would do with bread when you start squeezing it and pushing it together. 
right? So this is symbolic to the hermetic sealed vacuum that we find ourselves in right now as spirits, not only the body, but also our world where we're all in here together kind of getting squeezed or needed in order to actually produce something. So let's make a few things very clear before I jump into that, because that's actually how things are actually created, because we need each other. So even though you'll find these folks beefing, male and female alike, they still need each other in order to create. So when you ever want to ask yourself, well, why don't they end it already? Or why doesn't Jesus come back? And, and you should already know that if you expect a man to come up back and clean up anything, then you got to be a fool. <laughs> a woman, you probably would be expecting a woman Messiah before you expect a male Messiah. You know, that, that's one of my, my astrological metaphysical jokes. But just think about it. Like <laughs> on the deep level, we have to realize first, again, when, when the ancients are, are talking about certain things, let's get a full perspective of the, of the, of the symbolism and, the, and the, uh, the essence of what they're referring to. So the first thing that we're going to do that with is the, uh, the, the word heaven or basically this place heaven. Where is heaven or where is as above because some want to sync that word heaven with haven and then go off into, you know, all this different levels of awareness between the etymology of the word. But just directly, where is this place called heaven? Because it clearly seems like because they're saying as above, so below, not necessarily as below, so above. It means that whatever is going on in heaven actually affects earth. But we will have to determine where this place is. And so when we zoom out for just one moment, I want you to imagine that it's highly possible from what I've now come to, to discern that when in the ancient, in the cult writings, they, are, they talk about a boat and they keep talking about these boats. What they're actually talking about is earth. I want you to imagine for one moment that, and we may, I don't know how we miss this. Like every time I, I just feel like I just, I'm just in a world and, I, and the joke's on me and maybe all this is just running and it's all a simulator because I'd be seeing something I'm like, how did we not get this? Notice how if you dig really deep, generally anywhere you're at, you'll hit water, right? And we already know that even though the water is thinner, as you go up in the air, there's still water. So it's like we're always in water. But we know there's also a sea level. And then there's this thing actually that our ancestors referred to as the living waters. It, there seemed to be like this classification of water now. Like I thought it was just, you know, uh, Dusani, uh, Pellegrino, hydrogen water. But no, it seems that the ancestors were into that too. And they've come up with this thing called living waters, which they said was the beginning of the netherworld. And they demarked that the living waters were actually the ocean, but there were other waters in the sky, right? And then the deeper you go into the earth, you hit all these rivers or more water. So it's kind of like then if you were like on earth, you're on like one huge cruise ship. I know some of y'all trying to figure out where the buffet is, but serious, it's like you're literally in this space and you're actually floating in this space. Now, because we know this space is infinite, then we can already gather that we're floating in infinite space. So when our ancestors referred to heaven, what they were actually saying is basically any unreachable space or any space that is generally unreachable or difficult to traverse. And that actually made up three different places for our ancestors. One of them was the sky that the ancestors proficiently said that there are, in fact, worlds that are in the sky, but they're made out of a different material, a different vibrational frequency. And for the frequency that we're in, in order for us to go there, we have to leave our body, i.e. go to heaven. And it was an unreachable place by the physical body. They also talk about the sea being also heaven. It is very clear in many texts that they're, when they're referring to heaven, they're actually referring to the sea and that there is an entire show going on in the sea right now, in the deep. 
entire realms, kingdoms, beings, vast knowledge, intellect, the whole nine. But this place was also seen to be a heaven because you as a land lover can't go there. <laughs> they say even from the level of how much we've discovered space, quote unquote, we've discovered less within the depths of the ocean, also known as the Abzu, also known uh, by many ancient terms, right? So very specifically, we want to see very clearly that this notion that we may be on a boat, i.e. a turtle, if you may, is not really far-fetched. And then moving from there, what we'll do is, is we now will say, well, who lives in these spaces? Because, oh, one more, excuse me. There's one more space that our ancestors also called heaven. And this is a space that we're now calling the astral plane. And the onset to the first level of the astral plane is generally the dream world. So you're very familiar with this place, just like you're very familiar with the ocean, just like if you went and jumped into a balloon, you would be very familiar with the sky. So these are all places that based on your vibratory frequency, you can interweave with. And you can intermesh with. And in fact, because you're hyperdimensional, you actually have some stake, like a literally like um, an inheritance, like a lot. Remember, inheritance is generally land, right? It's like you get a chance to own the same land that your parents had. So on all these realms, you got land. You also have a vehicle that corresponds to all these spaces that is remote controlled. And we talked about this last week. But it's remote control from the consciousness. And for most people, that vehicle is laying covered somewhere, probably in the desert. And it only takes for them to think of it and keep dialing into it to access the bridge of their ship in order to call their ship, because that's how we operated. We used uh, another form of ourselves to move around through different spaces to bring us things from those spaces. Right. So this is also known as uh my, my term I'm giving it is called angelics. So who lives in the sky? Who lives in the sea? And who lives in the astral plane? Because these spaces are all populated respectively, and they're known to our ancestors as being the heavens. So diving right into this, you know, what I would have to ask, though, is what is the beef? because all these places sound so amazing. This existence sounds so amazing. It sounds like there's mythological creatures and all sorts of stuff happening, but it seems like this conflict is, is, is plaguing us. So I would have to ask, you know, what is the beef, literally? And first I wanted to explain so that it becomes very clear to you is what the purpose of conflict is, is that since we've already come to a conclusion that we're on a boat, you can imagine the difference between since we got to go somewhere, like we're, we're moving through the cosmos, so we got to keep going, right? And so you can imagine that, yeah, maybe in ancient times, our system of propulsion was riding the galactic winds. So we would open up our sails, and then we would ride through the cosmos using the galactic winds coming from the stars to eventually visit and uh, generally, uh, <laughs> what's the term I want to use? Um, I guess the term is panspermia, but what it refers to is basically seed any world you go to. And it's very clear to see that even in the word semen, that that is the whole purpose is to actually go and explore all these different spaces and then create something in that space with the materials that are there. We'll leave it G rated like that. OK, so metaphorically in this boat, though, Sales were great, but let's say later on, we start using a different form of propulsion, very similar to how we're doing right now. We could use the wind and the wind's power. We can use the sun and the sun's power, but we choose to build these micro systems that are basically replicas of those things, very bad replicas to be exact too. And then those things are actually creating the same type, the, the same type or they're creating an energy, but they're creating that energy through conflict. But this is the source of propulsion. So I'd be willing to say that the source of propulsion right now for this boat that we're on is actually the conflicts between the two primordial forces that were utilized to develop the actual spaces that we're in. 
i.e. the seraphim and the cherubim, i.e. Ra and Nu, i.e. fire and water, the churners of the waters of life, okay? The churners of the water of life. So it turns out that this story that I'm actually explaining to you in 2021 speak is not new. It's not actually an invention or me just making up stuff right here. And I will come through this in an entirely different way. Like I come through this knowledge in an entirely different way and find out the knowledge is exactly true and already been talked about. So that's just the verification of the knowledge. But what, what the ancient texts say specifically is that to churn the milk, <laughs> there's a lot of milky like substances that are used to create life, if you didn't notice. So to churn the milk, though, it was seen that there needed to be these two opposing forces, i.e. the angels and the demons, i.e. was that Asuras and the Ahuras, i.e. the seraphim and the cherubim, i.e. the fire, the water, Ra and Nu, meaning the positive and the negative. This is an organic generator, the source of generation. So when, you know, people want to create, you know, like the technology is the advanced one. The technology is not the advanced one. The physical technology, the wires, the, all that stuff, that's not the advanced one. Those things are, the, are actually taken directly from and replicated from their original systems and how they function. And we actually are living in one of them. And so this diagram that you're actually seeing here on the screen is pretty much how our body works. And that pole in the middle is actually our spine. And when the left and the right hemispheres of our consciousness begin to churn in their yin yang, like logical slash spiritual flow, then they create life. And that's what I was saying before is that creating life is what we were created for. That's why we are in life. <laughs> And so if you wanted to do something else in your life, you have to first adapt to the awareness of what you're actually here for in the first place. And then what you also see is the reason why we create life. Because somebody, well, why are we doing that? Uh, to preserve existence at this level, which is actually a, a miraculous achievement for us to be here conscious coming from nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? They always we started from the bottom. Now we're here. This is like we started from nothing for real. <laughs> all of us. And then now we're here. And so to get to complaining about that seems a little bit silly, but very directly on this, this uh, particular diagram, as we're calling it, we're actually paying attention to certain forms. And I'm going to come back to this in a minute. But just remember, if you wanted to see this, you're, you're estranged, you're scientific, you would actually, you know, have to kind of digest this first, just from a simple elemental level, positive and negative. These are the churners of the waters of life, okay? Now, for those of us who, you know, we like it straight, like give it to me just how it is, we have to go into the ancient knowledge because we're not sitting here with this, you know, fictitious GUI over our face, imagining that everybody is a clay body <laughs> that life was breathed into and that there's absolutely nothing underneath the hood. It's like, yo, pop the hood, let me see what you got up into that cherubim seraphim body of yours. And then what you'll see is, is that now what you're looking at is some depictions and emulations of the cherubim throughout history, right? And her story. And it's just basically showing that there is a dialectic here. There's actually two primary life forms that all of humanity is originating from, but originating from in a way of what I was explaining earlier with this that as you get further and further into this, this is what even in the Hindu text, have you ever noticed how they just be going in with the symbolism? It's like they got a cow, donkey, goat, fox, peacock kid running around. You see what I mean? It's like, what is that? What are they trying to explain? And this is what they're trying to explain. They're trying to really give you uh, insight on the genetic mixtures as we keep going here. And as you know, the animals and every single thing that we're living in, the air, the elements, all this is involved in the composition of what we're calling the uh, what we're calling now the human being. But spirituality still is the study of spirits. And I, and, I, and I could be called a spiritualist. I could be called a occultist. So this means that this is my study. I call it a, being a metaphysician. And so in this case, that means I, I, I would need to be a little bit more. I can't just tell you, well, you got a neck ache. 
I got to be able to tell you, well, you know, your lumbar is cricket. Uh, it looks like you're putting too much pressure on your third disc of your spine. It looks like you got to, you know, I got to be able to, it looks like your, your chakra is emitting, you know, a, a, a different color than it's supposed to. It looks like, so I have to be able to analyze the situation and then from there begin to determine what I'm dealing with. But if I fail to look at the evidence, then I either am going to, I'm not only going to hurt somebody, I'm always going to be practicing. I'm never going to be a master. I'm always going to be practicing. I'm just guessing. And that's what folks be doing. They just guess it. Like I was seeing some folks today. I was like, man, they just guess it. I, I, I can see the passion though. They want to know. <laughs> so by all means, you know, yes, this knowledge needs to reach them so they can know because they have a passion to keep, you know, delivering knowledge and information, but they also have this, well, we'll, we'll fake it until we make it though. We'll just tell all out lies, stories, even just to keep everything going when, you know, maybe they don't know the truth yet. And so to, tonight and all the time, because this is for everyone here that has been in tribe for at least three to four months, this is nothing new. It is more refined, so that's always pleasant. But this, what we're seeing, we've seen this before in another scenario. So again, when you're, when you're discerning if someone is, is connected, if they actually are, are, are really bringing you something, then you gotta be able to do that with something, you need to have a tool of measurement. So that's going to be you at this stage. It's going to be how much you know. So you're going to be to be able to authenticate because sometimes I read some ancient works and I can tell when there's going to be gems because I can tell right away if a person really knows the truth or not, or whether they're just caught up in a different part of the, the lower levels of the initiation. And we're going to be talking about that here in a minute. Maybe they didn't ever even graduate it or finalize the initiation before they ran off and teach. You see that all the time. They're so starved for the attention, which is something that happens to us if we're, you know, when we're young and, you know, maybe your father's missing, your mother's missing, maybe your, your, your family was griping and grumbling, maybe your parents got divorced, all the different things that happen to where we feel like that we need attention. And so before they even graduate the course, they just go run out there and start becoming teachers in this knowledge and this wisdom without actually knowing about it completely themselves, never, uh, never finalizing their tutelage. So for me, it's really about, as I said before, I'm not this master guru sitting here in front of you telling you that I've been through all of this already and here it is, now I'm gonna tell you how to do it. What I'm explaining to you is that this is the journey that I'm on in real time right now and I've had experiences to authenticate that what I'm bringing to you is exact. And I'm doing that so that way we can keep opening up a vista that may offer a greater level of potential for us than what is actually going on currently in the reality with Project Lockdown, basically. You see what I mean? So it's like now is the time to activate these powers. But if we don't know what we're activating and we don't know that we even need to know how to deactivate sometimes and that we need a ground. And if we're not going to treat this like it's a real tutelage, this is a school like Socrates, Plato, all these people, these Syrians and all that, that this, this was serious, Pythagoras, et cetera. This is serious, this was serious to them. So speaking of serious, <laughs> that's exactly what it was. Notice how, did we not catch how serious does basically this? You see how that forms three? Just take a look at it again. They already proved that serious and that, you know, the star system out there called weight. Right. So this is the counterbalance for the cosmos. This is what's used to balance out the scales. So it shows once again that this yin, yang, yin, yang, positive, negative, positive, ra, nu, ra, nu. This energy is actually known throughout the cosmos to be how things are created. So this is why when our ancestors, when they're talking about, yeah, you know, we came from Sirius and there's something going on in Sirius. And so many of these angels, the air chair from Seraphim, they come from Sirius. This is also what they're referring to. It's like a, a system in itself of generative, it's a, a generative system of creation, first through energy and then through awareness. This is why now the, the strongest AI they have now that's open to the public is called Siri. So folks be calling on Sirius all day. Hey, Sirius. Hey, Sirius. Hey, Sirius. You sound like if I was an alien and I came here, all this would seem weird. Everybody wearing masks. They talk about these devices, talk about, hey, Sirius, this looks like Star Wars to me. So, but, but do you see how perception is? 
right? Like it's even like now when you see somebody in VR and you're not in VR, that's, it look wow. It'd be like they punch it on the air and all this stuff. Imagine, you know, being a voyeur and just showing up in one of those stations and seeing all that goes on. Do you see how weird that really looks? Do you see how weird we really are, right? But we want to normalize that because that makes us feel comfortable. But what at times we would have to do is realize that, yeah, if, if we understood just a little bit more about ourselves to realize that, hey, um, it looks like that your ancestors, notice how the image on the right, which is actually, um, I think that's um, a moon, which actually is in itself a cow or um, it has it has like a cow, it's a mammal face, but it's that master of perception that has carved that has also made it look like a cobra. So at a glance on the right, the image will look like a cobra at first with another cobra on top of his head. But then when you kind of focus your eyes, you'll see, oh no, that, that's, a, that's a calf of some sort. And it's because these are all not only real energies, but they're also symbols of the priest craft in itself. This of course is seraphim. So it's just that awareness that the top level to all of this, if you're not bottom feeding into just the derivatives, the, the, the lower levels of rule 30, you're just gonna go right to the sources or close enough to the source to kind of see how things come into play and how they were formulated. And then because you'll have a direct image of how things started and how they were created, you'll just see that that image keeps repeating itself. As I said before, even if it goes from humanoid to human or human, human to humanoid or man to mankind, underneath all of that are still the same components of how things function in the same purpose. So let's keep going here. So we have a, a great image here again of cherubim, as you're seeing here, and seraphim, just as a quick acknowledgement that the ancestors referred to across all cultures, this progeny, this interaction between what now people are calling aliens in our world. And they're not aliens, they're actually the ancestors. So they should have called it ancient ancestors rather than ancient aliens. Now, there are ways though, because see, your environment definitely determines your mode of behavior. Your environment determines your mode of behavior. So the thing about even on a Syrian level, the difference between a cherubim and a seraphim is like the difference between fire and water. It's like the difference between a being that lives in a space, like in this case, seraphim live in what we would call the spiritual realm. So every single thing that they deal with is it generally has something to do with light, sound, tone, vibrations, those kind of things, because those are the things that, that those are the tools of their reality. And that's how, that's the framework that they live in. So if all of a sudden you are propelled into the world of the seraphim, because you do have a portion of that type of energy within you, you would still have to learn how to adapt. And you would also see that their behaviors were a lot more different than from what you would be doing because you're from earth. <laughs> you see what I mean? And it's the same thing with the chair beam. Their world is totally different than how our world functions they are ancestors nonetheless, but because of the element that they actually live in, it makes them different. So your environment, for sure, as we've seen forever, your environment is going to control your behavior. And this environment is not just whether you live in the hood or whether you live in the suburbs. This is actually whether you live in fire or whether you predominantly live in water, et cetera. And the things that go on in that space and how things feel determine how you really are in your makeup. So if you want to go over to another being that lives into an entirely different world and try to convert them to democracy, <laughs> don't be surprised if you get a totally different response. And that's what I mean by what I mean by that is that we're always trying to bend everything else's existence to our level of perception as if it doesn't have its own perception. So we want to control every single thing and how it appears around us, almost as if it's not independent itself of any perceptions that we impress upon it. And that is ego, that is conceit. It is actually the supreme aspect of us also. Some will try to deny it and say, you cannot reach the supreme but I, uh, with, with it, but I would tell you, you also cannot reach the supreme without it. 
So there's a part of us that we feel as originators, we feel as creators because we do it. Literally, we have children, we actually procreate. So we saw then that Sirius moves like a dynamo. And we saw that, and it also talks about this, the Dogans talked about this, that when those stars come together finally so close and then they send out that reverberation, that that actually is what sparks off new life through the cosmos. It's like an energetic fluctuation of orgasm across the entire cosmos that impresses every single thing in that space, in that range, in that frequency to generate, okay? So it's the reason why you feel attraction and it's the reason why you feel magnetism. So the more magnetism that you have, is actually the more traction that you have. And it's like you're pulling things to you. So they say, oh man, she's attractive or he's attractive. So you can already see that in this world, we have things that are different things that are attractive to different types of people. Some people money is attractive. Some people women are attractive. Some people intelligence is attractive. Some people aesthetics is attractive. Some people can go nuts on a leather bag. You see what I mean? So the levels of attraction vary. But as it said in the ancient books, Sat is still known to be the highest truth. And I just want to break this down real quick because the Naga mentioned that Sat, also called uh, nowadays uh, Satan or Set, was seen to be the highest truth. It was it was not Guru then. Guru was when the when the when would you almost get like a, a, a what we call a, a change of shift. Okay, because guru is Jupiter, right? So before guru in the area of the Naga, that was Sat's territory. And Sat was seen to be the highest truth because Sat was six or Sat was sex. Sex is the highest truth because the highest truth still is just creation. As we politely uh, uh, elaborated on just a moment ago that the whole purpose of procreation is to continue the existence within all of these planes. So this is why in the highest levels of occultism, it only involves orgasmic energy, tantric energy, et cetera, and utilizing those energetic components to actually manifest and create and impress upon things. Okay. But however, we can also see that that road into those mysteries is barred because uh, so the entered apprentice is barred from the world of tantra that's why all of the the spiritual books such as the islamic books and the bible actually restrict because of as abrahamic or arimanic if you really understand who it is traditions they bar the initiate initially from sex okay and that also works also in the mysteries that if you absolve for just one moment and take a moment to draw your energy back within, then you can build up your energy. So the two events that happen in the Abrahamic tradition that involve the greatest levels of, of, of atrocities in their worlds have everything to do with sex. So that's why sex becomes the devil or sex becomes Satan. And this, of course, is the, and the cherubim, specifically mating with the daughters of women. And that's, of course, in the book of Enoch. And then also Adam and Eve, as it's called, uh, mating and coming together and creating Cain. So these are the two initial events that spark off, whether you're talking about Wuju Quran or the hidden, the hidden message, which was what really went on in the garden, or you're talking about even before then of the, the, the actual cherubim uh, themselves be creating chimeras here on earth or actually creating kings or giants or kahins, which is where we get our word queens, which are basically hermaphroditic beings that actually became the leaders and the rulers and also the originators of the nations here in the world, respectively. So we have then, if we zoom into this, we have to now realize that, so how is it then, or what is the responsibility primarily of a seraphim and what is the primary responsibility of a cherubim? Since while they, do conflict. And generally, anytime you see them coming together in history, there's always a big bang, like putting together the lions with the snakes seems to always get the fire started. I'll say that again. Putting together the lions with the reptiles seems to always get the fire started. 
And as I said before, our ancestors showed us that they were masters of doing this because they created the cat. And the cat has the eyes of a reptile and the body of a mammal or a lion. Okay, so the seraphim in this case are actually the serpents. And very specifically, because they are also sometimes called the jinn or made of smokeless fire, meaning that visually you actually cannot see them unless you're actually in the same body or the vehicle that you have that corresponds to the resonance of the space that they impress and live in and predominantly inhabit. So slightly out of the visual uh, spectrum, the jinn or DJ, this is also why in the Bohemian Grove, when they show you at the bottom of the flower, they have the little totem and they call him DJ. Also inside of the comedic tradition, we have the Jed or DJ ED, which the Jed is actually symbolic to the, the, the rod in the back or the Kundalini ri rising, which is a, a living energy. It's not just some pole sitting there that they're creating electricity for mud flood uh, for the, during the month before the mud flood period. It's actually a real living life form. And now also even in uh, Stargate SG-1, they try to depict the life form of the seraphim as being the thing that is in the head of the adherence of, uh, of what clearly is the Kemetan Empire. So again, they talk about how this thing, it lives inside of their head and it's like a life form and it sits itself in the seat of a person's, in, in the seat of their head and it controls everything. But remember, those are, again, diagrams of how the entire Adam Cadman is set up and that the seraphim who love to be on high set themselves up in the in the top of the consciousness. And this is why you would always see them either under the the uh, the symbolism of a serpent or a bird. We also know biologically a bird uh, a snake becomes a bird. Scales become feathers. So this is why it was always on the, the, the head of the crown, because that is where the seraphim like to reside, because naturally in their element, they are like light. OK, so they also, as being masters of the waveform, manipulate light, electricity and sound in order to govern what is being perceived. And when you talk about spirituality and teaching spirituality or any of that initiatory aspects of things in the priestcraft is generally in the hands of the seraphim, meaning that when orders come down from on high, it's, it's passed from a seraphim to a cherubim. So literally it's passed from a positive, if you may, to a negative. And this is how a light switch works. O means open, a straight line means closed. Closed means the circuit works. Open means the circuit doesn't work, which is actually opposite to how we think. This lets us know once again, you know, you have to play this back again later on for this to make sense, but we have a floating point in the center of our, our consciousness. So it means that we always don't have to be seraphimic cherubimic and act, like, act out accordingly every day in the reality that we can actually take the, the crown in, in the center of our consciousness and actually become the arbitrator between these two forces. And in that state, you become a supreme being. So for those that are got to, that got to catch out because it's been an hour for them and they're nodding off and you're looking sleepy, if you want to ask me what the purpose of all this is, I'm, I'm going to tell you directly. It's because there is always been, uh, I'm not sure if you want to call it a project, an agenda, an endeavor, a passion, a motivation, any of those things to create supreme beings. So our ancestors are looking to get supreme being out of us. Like they want to see us actually become supreme beings and they will keep taking us through the process. See, now our definition of a supreme being is going to be different than probably what it really is as we come to more and more awareness of what it is to be a supreme being. So even if I said, well, the goal is, is that they actually want to create gods. Your idea of what a God is will probably be totally different than to what they perceive and know a God actually is. Because you may still be thinking from that simplistic yin yang humanistic binary status. You see what I mean? While the intention is for you to actually become trinary, if you may, or singular, if you may. And in that process, 
you may go through all of this yin yang, all of these different initiations, all these different things that are happening to you, these different sexes, you come out as a female, you come out as a male. So all of these different things will happen as you're gaining more experience about how to be a supreme being. So when you're back there whining, because maybe you took on the wrong partners, then still remember that that was the overall objective and goal. And for those that are guided, the goal will be reached. And I'm telling you, if you're here today by laws of resonance, you would not be here listening to this if, if you didn't have that same guidance and that same frequency that's saying, yo, just pay attention to what's being said. Seraphim, cherubim, okay? So now let's just imagine the cherubimic world because as I said to you before, so if you see the seraphim, by, by order of creation, they are actually above cherubim in a certain way. But you would never be able to uh, get a cherubim to acknowledge that. <laughs> and I'll just say it like that, that you got real beef, as I mentioned, going on in these worlds. Because, again, as I explained, you get you get um, variants. <laughs> it's not exactly like the originals because the originals are the parents. These are more of like the children and then kind of how they see things, because also some of them are mixed seraphim and cherubim now. It's going to all depend. <laughs> you never know what you may get. But very specifically, also, there's one more thing that I wanted to mention about the cherubim, or excuse me, the seraphim. They're big on purity. When I can tell you that whole idea of purity, pure bloodline, all of that, don't made into the family, which was originally starting in al Bulan with some of the ancient tribes never marrying outside of the tribe and keeping every single thing in the blood and in the memories and the, the controlling of the spice, et cetera, within those families, that is seraphimic. They are purest. Our word pure comes from fire, right? And the word seraphim comes from seraph. Uh, seraph is a fire or fiery being, okay? So just directly, that's why Kundalini is a seraphim. It's, a, it's involved in initiations and priestcraft stuff, okay? But in that respect, there's this thing about purity, and so it's important to understand that also, because that's why when you generally see any kind of spiritual priestcraft initiation, oh man, we let's clean up, let's get pure, let's not do any sins, let's do no sex, let's not taint ourselves, let's not, because that that's that side of the brain again. You remember that side of the brain I was telling you about, the good angel? The seraphim love to take the role of being the good angels, okay? So now that you understand that, we move over then to cherubim, and cherubim, to understand cherubim is like, now somebody's got to now do, <laughs> let me say the dirty work, the, the load. Something's got to carry the load. Something's got to come into what we would call the physical and actually begin to set out governance in the physical. This is also called the, guberna, the gubernator or the gubernatorial, which actually refers to a ship of government. OK, and these are cherubimic forces. Now, the cherubimic forces generally go under the symbol of a horn because all of the cherubim themselves, the original cherubim are horned gods. Now, this is what becomes interesting because the, the cherubim in many ways were also purist. So when you can see a human being, a human being is of deep level into the chimeric mixing. Because we also contain our mother, which is actually more of a cow goddess, okay? Especially our sisters, right? So we got, we got a cow goddess. We got, you know, uh, uh, a horn god or, or um, what you would say is a, um, man, the term that I'm looking for, I have to come back to this. But basically what I'm saying is, is that, because, like, you know, you still kind of get the cow goddess still within the horn tradition. That's kind of what tripped me up there. But it's very specific that, the Ar Ariman, also known as Abraham, who you're looking at right here, was the son of the cow goddess. But Ariman is the architect because the cow goddess actually metaphysically impregnated herself with her own son. So she was parthenogenic in that respect. Parthenogenic is when you can generate from yourself. This is the being they sometimes call Gaia. So in her projection or her, her own orgasm, she created her own son. And this is how life began here on planet Earth 
or you could call it another planet. You could call it wherever you want, but that's how it starts. And that that is why a lot of people are, are not, a, not aware because they can't fathom, well, when you see the Virgin Mary, which is now what, what who the, who the uh, mother goddess is now, when you see the Virgin Mary, she's holding her son. So you, that's Madonna holding her son. But you're not realizing in the mysteries, it's known that the, her, her son is also her husband. And that's how the bloodline continues because basically what came first, the chicken or the egg. And so that's what seemed to also be known as the abomination that set up desolation. This is again, uh, now seraphimic speak because remember the seraphim are against any kind of breeding and any of that, especially without their sanction. So the actual progeny we know as the Nephilim, which make up Ariman, are the giants themselves or those that are mixed with cherubim and physical human beings. Okay, so this was seen as a corruption in the bloodline or an unsanctioned. So the, the Nephilim basically are un, an unsanctioned life form. The seraphim were already doing what you would say is genetic mixing and genetic experimentations, and the cherubim were engaged too, but they were not the ones who were supposed to be conducting the experiments. So in this case, the, when the cherubim begin to do the mixing, they what they created was then known as unsanctioned. And that was the Nephilim. Now, the Nephilim are still around today. They are now in the NFL with big giant contracts. <laughs> They're slightly larger than the average man. They generally have a little bit more uh, stamina. And they are now the mighty men are renowned. But instead of running over cities, they're running over the 30 yard line because that is exactly how the seraphim will come into a reality and actually channel all of the energies and all the forces and and basically create dikes for runoff. So it's like, OK, yeah, instead of y'all killing each other, just be red team versus blue team. Right. The seraphim will initiate many into mysteries through linguistic systems. This is why they control generally the music industry. And the lyrics and the words, et cetera. And then, as I said before, now that we're so far down the ladder, there is now cherubim and seraphimic mixes going on. And they seem to have like, uh, uh, like an agenda to do or be a part of both things, the spiritual world, the, the physical world, the governance of things. So this is what's going on. So I'm just trying to get you to see these energies at their core and their root. So then you can recognize them no matter in what shape or form or guise they come in. So as I explained before, all Abrahamic or Aramonic forces have the same angels because the thing about the demerge was the demerge basically drew a 33rd which means that a 33rd which is a part of a the like if you divided the the um the spaces into three the third bottom layer became in service to the demerge so this means that the demerge can form and create and shape and fashion anything from the third bottom layer of the tools in his mother's uh, box, <laughs> literally. And what that has created since the demerge has began to creating, creating, that the demerge began creating is a slew of beings that became what you would say is subservient to the demerge. So in, these, in this case, this is what's referred to as the angels, which in themselves are more like programs that are given specific commands and then carry out those commands. And that's how the Abraham or Ariman became the architect. OK, so just very specifically, the God in Mithraism, also in Freemasonry, also in most secret societies, when they're referring to an architect, a king, a kahin, a builder or a herm, a Hermes or any of those words, even a Jesus, is actually Ariman. Under all the many different guises and faces in which Ariman can take. You see what I mean? Okay, so now we understand that. Now we have two forces in the world. One physical, actually responsible for creating the courthouses, the legal system, all the different structures that you can see, the spiritual systems of governments from the, ex the exoteric, meaning the churches, the pastors, the whole nine. And then we have this secret priestcraft 
that is initiatory, that is conducted by the seraphim, that involves kundalini awakening, monkhood, uh, um, uh, interfacing with hyperdimensional life forms, all of those things, mastering the waveform, controlling light, learning about language and linguistic systems and symbols and codes. Okay, so, so do you see why there needs to be a dialectic here that the seraphim are not interested in doing what the cherubim do and the cherubim are not interested in doing what the seraphim do, but them working together are capable of actually creating the propulsion of this continuous projection that we're, in, we're living in called the boat. So a big crack in the metaphysical mysteries is once again, when they're referring to a boat and they're saying those who are born on the boat they're talking about us, okay? Because the world is a boat. And as I said before, the quarrels continue because they, the quarrels continue, but they need each other or we fight, but we need each other. So I'm gonna take a moment there. Does everybody realize once again that even though we're fighting, we still need each other and that that's kind of how it works? And of course, unless we come in and draw some conclusions and then move on to create our own future with all of these powers, then we just kind of stay in this weird zone of that even though we need each other, we keep fighting, which is where most families are right now. I'm gonna take a moment and, and get a drink of water or some, I'm not gonna say most. I would hope that most families are connected and in love with each other, but you and I both know there's a lot of dissension in the household and even though everybody need each other and when the pandemic and shit broke out and then, you know, folks lost jobs and shit, they went back home with the same mama they complained about that wouldn't be awoke, went back to church, called on Jesus again to the whole nine. So there's always fighting, but we need each other. And this need is K-N-E-A-D, right? Because that's etymology. And it's just that tension of making this bread. <laughs> you see what I mean? It's like, we got to eat. So we got to live, but there's still some conflict here because one is pure fire and the other one is watered down for real, like all flow. All right. So I'm going to take a moment. I'm going to get a little bit of, uh, of uh, liquids here. I want you to do the same thing. There's more to this. I'm going to come. I'm going to come for it. This build tonight was it's a magnum opus. It's very similar to when I did the surviving 2017, which was or how to move on 2017, whatever. And, and it was like, then right after that, all of the stuff happened in the world, but all of us was prepared. This is that same thing. This next stage is so vast. It doesn't involve like the negativity and the crazy stuff. It's actually about how we are now coming into the awareness of who we truly are. And then now we're just like, okay, I'm, I'm good with the history and the herstory and the beefing and the quarrels and the snake. And the, bat and, the, and the mammal and all that. I'm so advanced at this stage because of just this, this complete rainbow, if you may, of genetic blend that I have, that I'm actually gonna take this formula and I'm gonna change destiny with this formula for myself. So that's what it is. So we're gonna give it a minute. Let me go ahead and get some tunes here and we're gonna start in just a second. And it's good to get some water. It's good to refresh. We're gonna take 10 minutes. We're going to take 10 minutes and then we're going to come back into a wholeness. Our purpose. Our purpose. The resistance is planning something bigger. To the future to be exact. Do you really expect us to believe such a story? Well, you, well, you just... Uh, certainly. But you yourself just said that it hadn't really moved. That's correct. Well, then why can't we see it? Because we're in this room on the 31st of December, 1899, but the model we just saw is perhaps a uh, hundred years away by now. Th this room, even this whole house, may not be here in a hundred years. But the time machine occupies the same, the same space that it did a moment before it went off on its journey. Well, if it's occupying the same space, it, well, why can't I feel it? You must remember that the space you're putting your hand through is today's space. <laughs> you, you can't put your hand into the space of tomorrow. <sighs> the space is space. It doesn't change. The same space that's here now should be here in a hundred or even a thousand years. No, ago. Philip. Time changes space. 
Look, th th this flat ground we're standing on could have been at the, at the bottom of the sea a million years ago. And a million years from now, it could, it, it could be the interior of a huge mountain. All right, all right, suppose what you say is true. What do you expect us to do with such a contraption? Contraption? For my part, I intend taking a journey into the future. Murder, dear. You can't even travel around your own microcircuits without permission from the master control program. I mean, sending me down here to play games. Who does he calculate he is? We have here nitric acid, glycerine, and a special mixture of my own. Together, it's horrible, dangerous stuff blows you up. The mix together in the right way is only I know how. What do you think it makes? I don't know, sir. Of course you don't know. You don't know because only I know. If you knew and I didn't know, then you'd be teaching me instead of me teaching you. And for a student to teach his teacher, it's presumptuous and rude. Do I make myself clear? Yes, sir. Go yeah, away. hundred billion points of light. But where you see light, I see worlds. Though the blood of a king runs through your veins, it is pumped by the heart of an explorer. The mark at the heel. I can't be the first one who wanted to see my youngest son. Why can't we see it? We have here nitric acid, glycerine, and a special mixture of my own. We got two more minutes in this. This is probably a good time to return into the space. The galaxy. The galaxy. How dare you? Money 
living in fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you! Woo! Okay, okay, okay. Wow. Let's go ahead and keep going. Wow, I just feel so uh, jubilant this evening. As always, it's just been an amazing opportunity to be here in front of the citizens of the galaxy and to actually be transmitting something that is useful to consciousness and growth rather than destructive and degradative. And that says a lot about just what the future is going to be as all of us see more and more the power and the potential of what we are and what we can become. Now we have something that we call the timeline project. And the reason why we do the timeline project is because we always um, come to realize that the way we see the past is not necessarily the way that it happens. And sometimes it's important for us to take a moment to recount exactly what happened in order to see how our perception has changed. And so I just wanted to say here to this tribe and to everyone that is on the line, thank you so much for becoming a major momentum catalyst for even me to continue to go on and to stay true to this message and to realize in life that I'm yet even to create the climax of my existence and I'm working towards it constantly. And let us all engage the sails of our wind and actually remove ourselves from any type of just motor or motivation and realize that we have this inexhaustible power that actually allows us to move through. So the center of your consciousness is predominantly designed for you to, even though the yin and the yang of the seraphim and the cherubim is going through your consciousness, and that is a form of how existence functions and is its purpose that you're able to stand as arbitrator or actually riding the chariot. Does that make sense? Like the chariot is cherubim and seraphim and where you are is actually at that, that what they would call Godhead or at the supreme stage. So you can't necessarily, your, but your process though, that's what I will say. I can't, I won't say what you can't do. Your process is actually coming through these grades that this is actually what they call the degrees of initiation or what they're calling when you go to school, you get a doctor's degree, you get a PhD, et cetera. You get, this, you get these degrees. That is actually you, that is taken directly from you going through different experiences and learning things in those experiences that make up who you are. So I trust that that is very clear. So let's keep going with this. Sheeps and goats, ships and boats. Just to be very clear, as I said before, in the seraphimic priestcraft system, there is a big play on words because you remember how in World War II, because in many ways this is warfare, that's why there's a worship, there's worshiping going on. So those are warships. And in that process, you remember how I was explaining that, um, you know, in the Old Testament, when they talked about how there was there was this time where there was this building and there was a unification happening and it was about to all pop off for us. The conflict came in through language and language started to become the component that created the confusion and the division amongst us. And however that took place, it's very important to realize that just like in World War Two. There, were, there needed to be a form of communication between, the, let's say, the Germans and their troops, respectively, uh, or the Axis and their troops, respectively, and, and everybody they were communicating with, and the Allies and their troops, respectively, and everybody that they were communicating with. This is classic bird versus snake behavior. Uh, but the language and the dialectic changes in what must be used as a coding system. So I'm sure everyone that has studied such things remembers that there was an Enigma machine. And this coding, this coded system was used as the form of communication and it couldn't be cracked because there was a need for the master key. And what we've been doing, not only with the code of the matrix, is we've been consistently going through the process of extracting the master key from etymology and actually seeing, as you know, that there's different letters and words that are actually the same. 
And when you look across linguistic systems that you'll find that there are certain letters and there are certain numbers that are, are well, the specifically letters, there are certain letters that are actually interchangeable for the same letter inside of other languages. And it leads to this amazing story about actually our life and deep levels of awareness that cannot be refuted because the cipher itself uh, actually reveals the code within the language. So that's why I was always saying that, like, even as being named James, because a G is a J, uh, games is the same name as James. And that's what I was saying, you know, in the beginning it was like, yeah, James, you like to play games, but it was really trying to express that, they, hey, there's something going on in the language that you're not looking at. And the words that sound alike and are sometimes spelled alike actually do mean or have some type of relationship with each other, but not exactly the way that everyone thinks. And also, this doesn't just exist within your language, James. It also exists within all the languages of the world. And now you're about to get uh, an awareness of how to put your will back together because your wills are broken. And that you got these wills all over your body. This was the beam before I even knew about chakras. It was like you got these wills. And the one, the main one you need to be focusing on right now is the one within your mind. The will within your mind keeps stopping because you just, you're, you're, you're stopping and not only stopping, it's looping. And you're looping. Look at you. You've been, you were doing the same thing. You just don't remember three years ago, three years, two months, and five days and three minutes ago, where you were sitting in this exact point in the bed, looking up at this exact wall, feeling this exact way. And you think you've grown. You think you've gone somewhere. And so just that awareness uh, was enough to allow me to say, yes, I don't want to keep repeating these cycles. I see it. I'm just going to get everything and lose everything, get everything and lose everything. What do I need to do is to reverse your field. Like basically, if you if, if something's going on and you don't like the way that it is, all you got to do is do opposite. So what are you doing? You're spending all this time. And so that's the tutelage. Right. And I'm getting that as a transmission because as as a guy like my father is Joseph, my grandfather is Joseph Henry Lyons. The Queen's father is Joseph Henry Lyons. There's all of these synchronistics that you just I see all the time. And everybody else has this in their life. When we start looking at genealogy, it's like, yo, we have these weird planetary correspondences, like almost as if we're made from the planets. But yet everything we know says that we are. People text and tweet about it all the time, but do they really know? And that's what I was saying in the beginning of the conversation. Do we, are we really accepting any of this or are we in denial because we're trying to figure out what part of this is the good version? Who should I, whose team should I be on? Go team Seraphim, go team Cherubim. You know what I mean? I'm like, at least the team Cherubim will let you have cheerleaders. <laughs> but I'm just saying, it's like this, this game, how, how long do you think as, as a time Lord and as a masterful being and as hyper intelligent, all these different descriptions that we love to give ourselves that you could sit in something like this without paying attention to what's going on. And then finally deciding that, you know, you need to get in control and you actually need to make a move. And then the perfect part of all this is that when you decide to do that, there's already a framework completely to allow you to do that. And you won't be the first one. And you'll be glad that you weren't. I mean, like a lot of times, you know, there's this revelry about just being the first one until you hit a void of some shit you don't know or something that you cannot get through. And then you'll be glad that you have your ancestors because they already went through it. And in fact, they already were the originators of it. And they're also going to show you how you were too. And that takes responsibility. So we got to then take responsibility for all the kids. And I will show you as we end up today about, you know, some of the kids, they just like, it's just what happens. Like when you don't actually put a system there and lesson learning and a form, like you just let something go wild. It's not necessarily good for it either. Like, man, I, I see the difference between whether you're, you're disciplining your child, whether you're not disciplining your child, you see what I mean? And then kind of the variance. And you got to be able to see both of those to figure out which one is going to work for you. But the world right now, it's in need of parents. It's in need of initiators. It's not in need of babies and people who are attention seekers and, and you know, just have the money thing on their mind and just not expand it because then they can't even tap into the real framework. The framework is a blueprint to make anything happen. That's why we give from it freely, because it's definitely working for us like 12 years. So let's keep going with it. So as I was saying before, so we have this awareness then that. 
So, so we have a creator being. So it's important to, to highlight this moment because the, all of occultism at this stage, because there is now somewhat of corruption of seraphimic teachings uh, under the Axari or uh, the pretend Axari. I have to always put pretend in front of these replicators because they're not the originals. They are children, as we all are, of the originals and the way they have chose to express the ancient mysteries because they do have them in their possession. And many of them have begun to practice them and can actually utilize some of the power and the potential in which they in which they bring forth, it's just that, as I said before, like when the name of something changes and the representation of something changes, and then now everybody that wasn't in there before are now there, it, it, it's not the same anymore. You can't bring the, the, the university of life into effect until you have every member of life. <laughs> so you, you would need to bring together all cultures and raise them all up in order to be able to fully understand what it would be to be Axari or what it would be to be one who actually can control the light. Because see, even if you if you come into some level of awareness and activation and then you start using that as a, just a form of attraction, right? Just a form of attraction to, I don't know, make money or whatever a person wants to do. If they just use it for that, then it's like, it has so, it, it, it's like, it has so much more use. It has so much more that it can do, but it ha it is still now then tainted with that. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. So when we're talking about other spiritual systems and systems of power, we can't also confuse what those systems of powers look like back in the day. Like you can't confuse what Tantra looked like back in the day with what's going on right now inside of the OTO with uh, Tantra, with, with their version of Tantra. You see what I mean? Nor can you confuse the entities in which that they're, they're calling with the same entities in which were originally called because when the, when the energy comes through, it comes through the perception of those who call it. So I just wanna, you know, when you're sitting down with yourself and you're really making heads and tails of things, this is some of the things that come to mind. So I have one statement for you here and it, I'm just gonna read it off. It's a paragraph. It was a question about whether or not Lucifer, what was Lucifer, a seraphim or a cherubim? It was on quorum.com. And so I decided to take a moment to answer it, but it kind of segues into what we're building into today. And I mentioned that Lucifer is Venus. Okay, so now remember again, that now that the term is Lucifer, Lucifer is taken on a totally different setting from who Shukra was. Now Shukra, to, to be very exact about these terms and what the ancients say about Shukra, which was, a, which was the Naga, specifically says Shukra, which is Venus, actually came into this space, this boat, came aboard this boat with a system of knowledge that mapped out all of the stars and all of the lights in the sky, which delivered these systems such as astrology and, air, and language and everything that came forward from that. And that being was known to be or seemed like to be a, a reptilian in appearance, a visage even of a viper, or, but a female very clearly are feminized. Okay, so that was the original text. So now when we're using terms like Lucifer, that's gone through so many different filters and so many new different occult systems that it will not bear likeness and resemblance to Shukra. So in awareness of that as an adept, it says, I say Lucifer is Venus, an androgynous seraphim, who was seen to err against the purity and the principles of the Syrian and the Draconian high command by creating life from its own light or sun, thus birthing the demurge. The demurge is a chimera, a, a cherubim and seraphim. Energetically, they are opposite poles. Okay, so to understand the reason why the demurge has such a bad story about its bad behavior, et cetera, is not only the ones who are sending down that edict and decree, like who's writing that is the seraphim. The seraphim did not sanction the creation of the, of the demurge. So you can see Gaia almost like she was in some type of convent, if you were trying to bring this into like a, a, a human story, that she was in some type of Bene Jesuit convent working on her powers and went into an orgasm and created the demurge. And with her power shielded the demurge because she's a master of the waveform and they never even knew the demurge exists. Meanwhile, in that shadow or in that shade, which is Shaddai, the demurge began to create from a third of the light that his mother had. 
And in that process was completely in this, like, it's just like, I, I don't want, I don't know or could imagine what it would be like to just pop up in space and time and just try to create something from what you're given. And the madness that may ensue because you don't know where you come from. That sounds like many human stories. And that's also why later on, it's known that the architect in many ways, shape and form seeded the humans that are actually here because the architect was engaged in genetic modification in order to actually try to create a supreme being. You see what I mean? So it's like the same thing how we're trying to be here. We're trying to create like these smart androids or supercomputers and that type of shit. You see how we're like on that thing and we're still on that. That's what's been going on with let's create, let's mix this being, let's put these together. But again, only doing that from the, from a third of the components because that was what it had access to because that's what its mother had access to. So to understand that's what Shukra's position was. And from that point, as, I, as it mentions, the demerge is a chimera or a chair beam and seraphim energetically, they are opposite poles. So this is the birth of that conflictive thing, the masculine and the feminine, but still, so you're, you're, we're, we say, hey, we're masculine and feminine and we're in the same body, but we express these two components as if they're separate things. We even see in the world, there's a male and then there's a female. So what it's still saying is there's a, still a confliction when internally your masculine and your feminine are as still separate. And then you have, let's say, something in between. So we also know all spiritual teachings that teach you about real power are teaching, you're teaching you how to merge all of those energies energetically in your consciousness to fuse them together to create the, the ultimate, basically, right? So we already know all these teachings, but to be very specific, the demurge was positive and negative and highly positive and negative, okay, because of containing that level of power from its build. So it says, this I say, this creation was seen as an abomination, but initiated the reality we're in, which was built by the architect using his mother's tools. The architect or demurge is also Marduk, Hermes, Jesus, etc., maintaining its status as a lord, but also a rogue or a Theban, our word for thief, because as you see, there's an exclamation when the demur says, I'm the creator of all of this. And then the, then the mother says, no, you're not. Y'all the Baal, you're a liar. I'm the only God. No, you're not the only God. So it's just like a being that is not necessarily aware of what else is out there. Do you see how the story keeps repeating? Not, a being that's not aware of everything else that's out there assumes it's the only one that exists. This is humanity story, that it's the highest one. And then it takes all of the, just the elements that we have though. Like we think that we got the periodic table and that's everything in the universe, right? But they're always discovering new elements. But we're here with these 33rd of the periodic table basically and just creating with that raging out with each other because that's the that's the energy that was be, that has been birthed from and that's why they they mentioned in the gnostic tradition the anthropos because the anthropos is seen to be the perfect mind that all of this first was the anthropos before gaia before y'all the bale or the demerge before seraphim cherubim any of that was a perfect mind in which all this came forth from and so it's important to realize that our ancient ancestors always realized there was that perfect mind. So before they dove into things, they didn't necessarily take it like the same way that we process things. They processed it with compassion. They processed it like they were going through this experience and they were like crying and healing with it. Do you understand, understand what I'm coming from? They were expressing the strongest emotions, uh, listening and singing the song of life. Have you ever been singing the song and then you just start crying when you're singing the song? It's just like... If, if what they're saying is that the only way that you could really touch this was to really feel it, that the tones and the vibrations within it was what connected you to it. And that if somehow you became mute, if somehow you were convinced to shut up and you were convinced to not intone anymore, that somehow you would become disconnected from it. And geez, you know, just to watch the whole process is a lesson within itself like to go through this experience with everybody continuously and to know what we are and to still see how far sometimes we are from this total of awareness of 
how we need to cut out the, the bickering and the petty stuff and just how childish we could really be with this whole thing when we have all this potential, but man, we cannot expect to get the keys to a galactic spaceship and with a two-year-old behavior so that we can go and crash into something and hurt that too. You see what I mean? So there, there is a purpose and there is something that is happening here that is very deep. And, you know, the, the illusion is will actually make it seem like it doesn't mean anything. And that's actually what you're starting to see so much of in the reality is like folks have a different impression of what's happening here and they're not in tune with it. And they don't think that it's alive anymore. And like I was saying before, like, I still don't think we're at all near an end, by the way. Actually, I believe that the end happened a little bit before when we got here. And now we're on the reboot of the cycle. And this thing is just starting to wind itself up. Right. And so but just an ode to wow, just the process of going through this as, you know, we're coming into this. And that's why I was saying, like before, I think personally, based on the symbolism that when the mother returned, that the mother Leb is some type of aquatic female lion. Like she seems also to be seraphimic and cherubimic kind of like I'm still again, spirituality is the study of spirits. And so I believe that the mother returned. And that she was the real Messiah. That's why they got the male as a Messiah right now. And then everything is like, ah, let's hide, let's veil the woman, the idea of what was one, what woman really was, mag, the actual attractive component, right? It's like the that magnetic component, right? And then seeing how, you know, the return of the mother seems to be almost like a, a, a shock wave of bliss where everyone heals all in, in a moment, riding out into a higher frequency. And that's the return of a Messiah, right? So this is what, you know, you start decrypting once you can get through all of the, the warfare, right? Because the warfare is destroying the relics. You see what happened in Iran? Like they tore all of that up. So there won't be kids coming. They'll see it in three, they'll be in the metaverse. They'll have an at scale model, another replica. So the further and further we get from the truth, you see what I mean? But there's there's replicas so people will feel like they're connected to it, but it won't actually be it. And that's what we need to see. That already happened. These technologies are so advanced, man. Like I'm going to explain that here in a minute about the matches, the waveform. They stay on the, what, the, what we would call the bleeding edge of technology for us. And then the moment that we start feeling like we're adapting, they change the system again. And then we like got to change over again. But I want to talk about that in a minute. Let's keep going. Sheeps and goats. So as I sh showed you in the linguistic system, there's there's codes in there that if you ever wanted to ask a question about something, then you would you would get the answer to it. So the sheeps and boats and uh, sheeps and goats, ships and boats pun through the linguistic system is a reference to that. In the cherubimic, in the cherubimic lines, there's a sheep and then there's a goat. Okay. This is Israel and Ishmael. Okay. Now this is very, it, this is like, now you're in the cherubim world, like seraphim, another story. We'll talk about that in a minute, but in the cherubim world, there's sheeps and goats. Okay. Now in these, in these, in these lands, respectively in the East, you have sheep herders and you have goat herders. It's, it's like, Every, every single thing is replete if you wanted to go and find out if what I'm saying is true. All the way to the point of, as we saw in Alien Wombs and Spirits, where the czar, which means a, a, a foreigner, it's a jinn, is actually interacting with the people and they're doing this when they want to pass this entity from a person back through this, back into the spiritual world. They'll bring a goat and then the entity will go into the goat and they'll cut the goat's throat and then the goat will die and the entity will go into the spiritual world using the goat's soul as its carriage, okay? And until it reaches the stage that it should go. This is the, the spiritual stuff that the ancestors are playing around with, by the way. This is the same reason why in hoodoo or, or voodoo or woot, which is called wuju, which means forgotten, right? In that tradition, they kill these chickens because they're basically trying to send the message that they're sending in this cheap-ass chicken soul, <laughs> just at the most basic level. Why do you think they're sacrificing? Because they're, they're, when they're sacrificed, there's something like a dove that is ascending from the person called their soul, and this dove is carrying the message in which the person that has, has done that ritual is trying to bring forth into that, that space, 
right? So when you're seeing these sacrifices, it's it's tied into the types of entities that they're actually communicating with and that they actually need human souls to journey and to carry that message. You see what I mean? So this is, again, the dynamics of soul. It's like soul dynamics, like the different things that souls can actually do and can be used for. So if you can imagine in a vast system like this, you need to be on point. And that's why it's great that we actually have protection in many ways. That's why we're actually in here in our mother and she's hermetically sealed. It's her niece, not him niece. Okay. So she's hermetically sealed inside of a womb so that certain things that would just end it right away can't even get in here. Just like certain viruses that would get right into your body. If you had a hole or an open wound it get right in there and then infect it and you got to cut it all off. So there is still governance here. Make no mistake. Like you may think this thing is wild, but see, the more they open it up in the vastness of what can actually take place here, the higher level of the potential of the energy that can actually be generated. So Seraphim are going to regulate that. Like they are in themselves, the ones who are always trying to figure out how to optimize and govern the energies. Okay. So I just want you to understand that why you're not maybe paying attention to what's going on. That's definitely why you're not running the world or your world, because this thing is like a boat. And if you're not watching where it's going, the consciousness could crash, the existence could crash, the ecosystem could crash. So there is an entire hierarchical system from all the way into the physical beings, especially those who are aligned within the craft, all the way to those who are actually non-physical beings and actually in governance into what are the astral planes guiding consciousness and guiding thought. Okay, so just to be very clear, this is not like willy lump lump lazy stuff going on here. There's a level of mastery that has already come about in this realm, and this is the level of governance. So as we keep going forward, what, what, we're, what, we're, what we're seeking to become aware of is that, uh, okay, so now we want to, okay, so now we're going to finalize here. So now that we're kind of aware, all right, so there's two energetic forces, you know, this, it gets very deep. We don't have to talk about that today, but the last thing that we want to zoom into is, is that seeing, so how is this impacting us? Because we're starting to see mental health issues now. We're starting to see depression. We're starting to see, uh, you know, control over people and they're not like responding to that well. So we're trying to, we're seeing all of that and we, we got to understand where does that come from? So my statement to that is, first of all, at a certain point, this degrades into warships. As I mentioned before, not only the word worship where there's these gods and then people are bowing down to these gods, but also worship in a tense of that they're actually symbolically Seem to be a seeming to be a stratos, which is also the root to our word strategy. So it's basically a arraignment or a organization of governance that is modeled basically so basically that is modeled after the original system that is now basically implementing governance. So I guess in conclusion, what I'm saying is is that. Because, yeah, I, I see my I was kind of went back in my notes real, real quick here because I, I actually forgot something. And then we're going to continue with uh, the angels uh, or Air, Ishmael and Israel and the double edged swords. But I, I saw something here and I just kind of like, OK, let me jump into that. So just very specifically, since this comes first, there is a debasement. That has been going on over history to humanity, this is why. In all of the spiritual systems, the humans are always seen to be not good enough. You know, this is just a reset point here, okay? Because I kind of, you know, I got caught up in the glorious aspects of things, and it's like, okay, wait, 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 let's let's vibrate resonance here, and let's just finish this transmission. So there's always this thing, if you notice, that there's always something that we're looking up to. Again, whether it's the general whether it's the president or whether it's because we're not rich enough or whether it's because we're not the right color or whether it's because we don't got the right clothes on or the right shoes or the right car. So do you notice how in the reality there's this consistent algorithm that you're not good enough, right? So where does that come from? And I'm telling you, it comes from the warships. The warships themselves are, you can see them as 
non-physical. They're like UFOs, if you may, but they're basically thought patterns. And when they start to purvey everything, then everything begins to conform to that shape or to that design. And that shape and that design is a debate shape and design. It's like saying that something else is higher or greater than me. And because I'm not as great as that, then I need to worship it. Now, some of the relationships that we've seen throughout history between humans and the, and the in this case, the demigods, were something to the tune of that it's kind of like if you go into, let's say, um, one of the poorest countries, you'll notice that the people are really giving. So if you go in into their tribe, the first thing they're going to try to do is they're going to try to feed you. They're going to try to give you some food. And so let's say that you look at the food and because you're, I don't know, from the high country or whatever, you're going to be like, gross. I don't eat worms mixed with dirt or from that type of plate. You see what I mean? And then you're going to feel like, there's nothing that I need from, from you, right? And meanwhile, these may be, be the people who hold the ancient knowledge, the culture, or the cure to the next crazy-ass disease. You see what I mean? So the experience with the people and many of the demigods was still very similar to the experience between the colonizers and those that they colonized. They will come into these lands and act like they didn't need anything from the people there and treat the people like that. So the humans got used to being treated like that, that these gods are so powerful with all these technologies and these ships. They used to call it the bell that when with the horn, that when the angel would arrive, it would make this huge blaring sound because they were vibrational frequencies and they would come into the reality like horns, like Mom. Boom, and they would have these these huge shams, which are like kind of like a, a what you would say is like a a, a a vehicle that is phasing in and out of this reality that they were traveling in. So you imagine, you know, <laughs> they don't even have PlayStation yet. Like even if that happened now, we're still gonna be like blown away. So imagine for these people, the first thing they would do is just like, do you want some? some corn <laughs> shit i don't know what to give you and many for many of them their experience was like they felt like they could never give the gods enough and that's kind of symbolic as that statement what do you give the man who has everything and so they started giving their children and i talked about this before like they felt like they needed to give the best the the, the best thing that they had and that's why later on, the terms for these certain entities, which I, I, some of them are seraphim, some of them are cherubim, actually was akin to, as Pierre also talks about, as being snatchers and takers and replicators that they would abduct. And that's where that whole thing came from in the, in the, in the traditions in the U.S. about alien abduction. But it was basically that, that they started giving their children to these entities. And you see it also in the cult of the Zayrin, and any of the, any of those covens and things, they consecrate the children to these entities because they feel like we don't have nothing for them. So what I'm saying is, is that there is a there's a wedge that many of these malevolent forces are trying to drive in to master over humanity. And they do that through debasement. And how they do it is, is they create this system that they don't actually abide by and, 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 and do. And then the moment that you're not doing it properly, now you're, quote unquote, the criminal, or yeah, now you're the lower one. Watch what I'm saying. People don't even know what, that's what I'm saying. This is about getting your shit together. <laughs> because in one year, you're going to see things that you've never seen before. Did you, do you understand that when, they, when there's this kind of pattern, right, and you're, you're, you're just looking for algorithms, so you're finding this pattern that why is it necessary to put everybody down and make everybody feel lower? And that's because they're, they're trying to usher in something that is already so low that you need to be feeling like crap in order to even accept it, right, as your leader and as your ruler, right? So this stage is being set, and you can see it clearly because what most people are not realizing is you see how, I'm going to show you in two ways that the world has, is, is making uh, the world is is is, manuf is about to manufacture an idea that basically most people are criminals. So that way people can start feeling like they're once again lower than this criminal ass gubernatory that we also have. One of them is, is first of all, obviously there's this big boom in cryptocurrency. But the main thing that's also happening is you have pretty much 
I don't know, 40 to 50 percent. I don't know if it could be that high. It could maybe be higher of the average U.S. or Western citizen actually investing in something that the SEC has not still yet classified if whether or not it's not a security and has already issued a warning and basically said that if you're if you're generally not if you're when the ICO starts, they tell you if you're in the jurisdiction of the United States, you cannot invest in this. Do you understand that? And then most folks we just click the box and be like, yo, here's my ether. Right. Because I'm trying to get out of this hellhole that I'm in of financial disaster in a debt based system. Right. I got kids to feed. But notice how they do, they broke the law, though. Okay, so let's just put that on the show. Okay, forget it. So the other one was, now some folks, they just was like, I can't do it with you in the Jabberwocky. But, you know, Silk Road and this doctor I got up the street and a few other folks, well, we got to connect. Nigga, we got Delta Passes, Sky Miles, all whatever you need. Like, what do you need? So they, as you saw on CNN, they're like, yo, there's so many fake, uh, CV certificates. I'm not going to say the word, but there's so many fake CV for certificates and shit. There's no way for us to verify all this. So you got upstanding citizens, right? Oh, doctor. <laughs> like, I peeped this. These are the people that think they're so good because the good angel has been sitting over there in their ear. Oh, you've done so perfect with your perfect job and you didn't turn the way of society. Yeah, actually, you turned maybe your back on society and the inner CD and all that, because after all, you're the good angel, right? Maybe you sent a little food, but now you just committed fraud. So in their system, you're low because they don't accept fraud. Now, the other thing was, here's the other thing, taxes, right? Watch how this whole thing plays out. So now in their new system, that's why there's a fork in the road coming. Decentralized and we still moving because shit, our currency is us. And we already have things that we're agreeing on has value and basically the control, uh, you know, like, you know, the real beast, like you won't buy or sell without CDBC and nobody will be getting no dope money. Nobody will be getting no weed money. Nobody will be getting nothing. And they're going to dry up the streets. And so you have no choice but to go to Waterworld <laughs> and, and remember that word Waterworld hang out, you know, when they went and protect yourself and be on your own sovereign stuff and try to hold your water from these bandits. You see what I mean? So you, you, do you see how all this is unfolding? And it's just like the natural progress of things. But if you know the future, then you can prepare yourself for this and actually it would be your benefit because then you would be able to develop an exit strategy because that's why all this stuff started in the first place. It's like, look, y'all need to either decide if you're going to serve your own self as a sovereign or if you're going to keep going forth with, I don't know, I guess they call it mammon now or whatever name they're giving it. And how does that manifest, though? Because I'm like, OK, well, that's that sounds like a, a pretty accurate conspiracy, maybe. But how would it pop off? Where are those components? Is this happening? Yes. Check it out. Go to YouTube, type in Palantir Vision, jump, jump on Buddy's page. Three. This guy's like a buff of Palantir. So he's been crawling all over everything that they do. You'll notice that Palantir just deployed in Foundry, a system that is going to now allow the government, which they're selling it to, to be able to trace every single investment that came through the cryptocurrency system back to the original wallet. So that way they can see when you onboard it in Coinbase. And then from that point, you know, probably about a year and a half, whatever it is that they say in you made, because you were supposed to pay your taxes, right? They're just gonna take, right? So also in the system, since everybody's gonna be on CDBC and CDBC is issued from their side and they're approved suppliers or authorized suppliers like Apple and like all the bigger jobs and like all the bigger gateways, They'll just have the CB CDBC integration for you to receive your paycheck through. Wherever you're receiving your money, hey, isn't it legit? You're legit, right? You're all legit. You see what I mean? Not never realizing that that illegitimate side of the streets is actually what's really actually keeping the economy going. Do you think that the people that have jobs are the ones that are going to the restaurants and buying all the boutique stuff and all that kind of stuff that allow all these little mom and pop businesses to function? No. It's the, it's the $500 food stamps that I was able to convert into $300 and actually go get them Nikes from that store that this dude put up that was a part of his idea how he wanted to sell store stuff in the hood, you see? So when that can't happen anymore, where are you going to be at then? Would you have built your own world already? Would you have woke up already for Wonderland, Alice? And realize that now it's time to be an adept or an adult and to stop being like a kid because you're programmed to stay as a kid or a sheep or a goat? Do you see why in the United States they throw the goat all around all the places? Because it's not just that the goat is some evil, ugly creature. 
Like if you ever had ghosts before, the ghost is cool too. It's like, okay, it's just a goat. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the spirit. The soul of a goat is a, is a, is a, it's just like the soul of a dog and just like the soul of, uh, of cats, just like souls of whales for a master of, a, of the waveform are actually waveforms that can be manipulated and waveforms that contain data, et cetera. So the goat in the sheep is directly based on, because now I think we're probably dealing with more of cats and dogs, to be honest. So as times progress, different bodies or different soul containments are used in order to be the transitory components for entire nations. So when you look at Ishmael and Israel, more important, who was it? Oh my goodness, was it Rebecca and Hagar? Come on, man, y'all gotta give me a little something. If that's it. So the, the daughters of Abraham, right? Like, so the progeny that comes from this makes up these two different tribes that we can call the double-edged sword. More importantly, a knife. You know how a knife has a straight side like this and a curved side like this, right? So a knife looks like this, right? Go grab one out of the cabinet if you want to see it. A knife has a straight edge and a curve because it's a reference to a sword. More importantly, words. Okay, now let me show you how this unfolds. So there's a double-edged sword, and, and that is a language. So basically, when, we're say, when we say, hey, yo, a double-edged sword, and when you see a symbol of an angel carrying a sword, they're saying that the angel knows the dialectic. The angel knows these different words that actually cut through the reality, which are tones and vibratory frequencies that are able to create what the humans think is magic. Okay? So... In where they encoded the priestcraft of holding those that that level and that system of power, which is also about calling forth certain entities to be able to do those things, is within two languages called Arabic and Hebrew. Now, if you go to Arabic and you see ancient, uh, uh, excuse me, if you see Hebrew and you see the first Hebrew, it's a square. It's it's a block in itself. We know that oh now it's a tetrahedron, but more imp importantly, there was no curve in any of the letters. Check it. Versus in Arabic, it's curved. Everything is curved. It's like Tamil, ancient Tamil, everything is curved. And this is because one language is curved and one is a straight line because one language belongs to the seraphim and the other language belongs to the cherubim. And that's why when you go into the Arabic culture, now this doesn't work across the board because again, you see very soon a mixture between cherubim and seraphim happen because the bloodlines were marrying into each other, trying to solve many of their quarrels and disputes. But you'll generally see in the Arab world that they work with the cherubim a lot. But like over, when I, now when I say the Arab world, I'm talking about Persia, I'm talking about Iran. Versus when you start heading over from Sri Lanka, which all this was used to be connected all the way up to Nubia, they were all working with the seraphim. And it's very clear to see that directly in the symbol and in, in symbolism until Solomon comes over and basically Im, imprints into the tribe of the Nagus, meaning that basically there's a marriage between Solomon and Queen Sheba or the seraphim and the cherubim decide to come together and they create Menelik, which again is a representation of the demerge because it's a blending of both bloodlines. But that's, so when they're showing you these movies and they're showing you all of these like high lords and they sit back in these chairs and stuff, this is what is really going on and being referred to about how these, these it's basically what's going on outside of, of this reality and in the space that you call heaven, which is either in the deep ocean is one is where some of it's happening in the air is where some of it's happening. And in the astral plane is where some of it's happening, but more and specifically, those are vibratory frequencies and to gain access to those vibratory frequencies is now the symbol of the angel with the key. Right. And so when you have these keys and you have actually these tones and these vibrations that actually open up these doors. And that's why the double edge, that's why it was then split between two lineages. So that way, neither one of them could really make it work because they don't work together. Do you see how right now in Israel, in Palestine, that that is the the epitome of it right now is Israel and Gaza. That's the last bit. But do you also see what I was saying about rule 30? Because none of those people that are over there right now are the original people. They just inherit, they're not the original people that were there. They inherited 
all of the beef. <laughs> and they took the beef. <laughs> you see what it means? But they inherited the seraphimic and cherubimic warfare and continuous power struggle that they're always engaged in, right? So I want that to be very clear. This lives out today and is going on because sometimes we can flow off into space and be like, it's all love. Nobody's getting hurt because <laughs> you're over here, you know, living in a puffed up Netflix world and people die out here every day. And this shit is very, very serious. There are people who lose their mind. There's deep levels of technology. There's more to this. But I'm also saying that sitting down like an ostrich with your head in the sand for infinity is not the way to go either. <laughs> so this is a tutelage. We start the process of going, climbing the ladder and making heads of tails of this. And yeah, for sure, if I couldn't verify any of this, man, it goes out the window. I got way bigger things. I could boot up my machines. I could start creating relics. I could bring NFTs into 3D. I could jump in with some of my folks that deal with the gyms. I can turn crypto back into gold. I can start an ICO. I can, you see me? So I got all this stuff to do, except for all of that, man, please. It, that may get done. Sounds like a great idea. I'll get to it. But the first thing, first things first, <laughs> infinity. How do I navigate these other spaces? How am I to master the waveform? How am I to live in the same steed of my ancestors and glide across the tip of the sun of new and actually be so dialed in and so connected that I'm really experiencing something incredible because I've actually had that happen before where I thought nothing could happen, nothing can go on. And all of a sudden I'm riding by the seat of my pants. I thought it didn't work. All of a sudden it's working through me. <laughs> I thought nothing was gonna happen. I took a <gasps> Totally didn't know that was going to happen. So it's possible. That's what I'm talking about here. If I can prove something that's possible, I'm going to keep going in that direction. I'm going to keep opening that up. I'm going to keep bringing light into that until I actually see how it all functions. Because I really want this. I want this for us. I've, I've been through every single kind of experience you can actually think of. And I'm a great example that you can make it through it. But now the way people see me, it's like they don't even they don't understand any of that. They, that. They're just focused on this. So only I can understand that, that look, you came from a long way. Keep going. Keep learning, keep expanding. There's basic principles to this. Remain available. If you're over there fighting all the time, trying to disagree, trying to hang on every single word, think about what's not what, what, what I didn't say right. You're not available. Your brain is only capable of opening up one channel, like a switch. Is it on or it's off? Especially before you learn how to access this. So this is for you then. So let's keep going. So as a master of waveform, you can imagine, since all the technologies that we're looking at now are direct plagiarization of the spirit, and since the jinn are spirit, so they already had the technologies before. Like bioluminescence <laughs> is enough power. There's enough power in the ocean to power entire projections of worlds and make them solid even. We have no clue of the vastness of the technology of our ancestors because they've been in the paint working on this beyond time. So what that also means is, is that we have to be aware that in warfare though, some of those same tools are actually used to kind of pull a wool over our eye, make us uh, to create spaces where we don't actually know what we're dealing with and what's going on. And it's almost like we're deactivated in those spaces. This has become one of them. Humans are not living up into, or living up, not living up to, but living into their power and their potential. Almost as if there was some type of treaty that there was an agreement that there would be a deactivation and that the beings here would not become aware anymore of their past, right? So this is about going forward and saying, okay, well, I got to keep going with this. If this knowledge and these secrets are my inheritance, then I need to know, and I'm at the stage and at the ability of being able to comprehend what should be brought forth. So in conclusion, <laughs> I was looking at my notes here and I almost like reached the end of my notes, but I had something, I have one more. Oh, here it is, okay. So now we get to the final part. And um, this is where it becomes a little bit uncomfortable because as I said before, there was so many different uh, reiterations. It's almost like if we don't begin to perceive who our ancestors were in the proper light, then they, sh they show up as phantoms. And it's almost like somebody else can give you an idea of what your own ancestors are like, and you start thinking your ancestors was like that. 
And then in some way, shape or form, when there's a high enough concentration of that, it can now bring forth an image of the ancestor that is nowhere near bear witness to what the ancestor was. But then somehow it's almost like hijacked the identity of the ancestor. And that's what I was saying about Venus. You see clear signs. It's, I can show you this in so many places. Same thing with Sat. The same thing happened. It just every single entity that they get their hands on, it actually becomes eroded and some kind of force of darkness. So I'm assuming that that's just what they do is they take something and they make it, they try to use it. They take something that has power and they try to use it as a force of darkness. They've done that with Tantra. It keeps going, right? So all we're looking for then is beings that don't do that. And that seems to be <laughs> very difficult. But that being that will do that, will unlock this. So, so this is all on the same tape here. As I said, that seraphimic diagram <laughs> that you're seeing there on the right is actually showing you that right on the back of your brain is actually a cherubim. This is why um, this was hidden in the mysteries again of, of Menelik, also known as MLK, Milk. Uh, now it's Moloch, and now it goes into all of this. But it's about the Messiah. That's why MLK was Menelik, that actually was on a cross or on the hemispheres of the brain. And that's the horns of the Messiah. And on the side of him are two thieves, or the side of it, because we know it's androgynous. It's hermetic. That's why we know that Jesus is, is the alchemy. Jesus is Hermes or the Christ, which is actually a formulation of a chrism. It, which is basically a combination of the fluids coming from both hemispheres of the brain. So again, we have this consciousness on the cross. And then in the center of that, even the consciousness's forehead is the pineal. So the pineal, of course, is where the seat of your consciousness is. And this is also where you want to be. This will be putting yourself into the seat. Okay. So that's how we also know that what we're talking about, again, with the seraphim and the cherubim is by it's biological. This is what was one of the things that that Pierre also was wanting to make sure that would that came across in his books is that a lot of times with the alien cults, they be making you think that the aliens are not even in this dimension. But the, the cherubim themselves are very physical and also the seraphim are very physical, but in their mastery of the waveform. What we're calling physical, they can actually cloak themselves inside of this. They can appear as anything here from the door to the tree, et cetera. But any sensitive can actually feel their presence. So from there, that then is the, the that's the code of many colors, right? That's the code of secrecy. That's the cloak and dagger. So I just gave you the cloak and the dagger. The cloak is a master of the waveform, one who can disguise themselves from the from disguise themselves in the reality and disguise the reality itself. Right. And then the dagger is the double edged sword or the actual mastery of the linguistic system, the abjad and the Kabbalah. Basically, that's now what it comes out. Now it's completely corrupted. Now they have Kabbalah and then they you don't even see abjad mentioned, which is basically Arabic Kabbalah. And, but in those systems is the dialectic, dialectic of the priestcraft, which basically reveals the codes behind the words within the language that give the command to command center, which is people's mind. And that is conducted through the linguistic system. OK, so we've also identified that the skirmish between the seraphim and the cherubim, respectively, still play out today within what we would call the Israeli and what we would call the Ishmael Ishma, or the Arab and the and the um, and the Israelite or the Jew, actually in this case. And this is this is again the 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 final <laughs> the final result of the seraphim cherubim clashes and warfare. And then <laughs> we also come to realize that since the Demerge was a lion faced serpent, that it's highly possible that his mother was a lioness. And because if you also understand that it still holds replete in the biological or in the environmental system, that lions, that the women are actually the one that are leading the pride, going to hunt and doing all these things. So in the feline thing, the, the woman is at the head. That's the matriarchal culture. So even if the son is running around, masquerading around, it's still his mother that 
is holding all the power. And that's what I was saying before about, and I didn't finish my thought, but I think that when the, they're also, if the mother is upset, because, <laughs> you know, you can't imagine that it's always bliss, right? Like we're pushing for that. So if you're wondering, hey, what am I doing here? What am I supposed to do, Seven? Keep sending love to the mother and letting her, just convincing her to do the bliss one. Because it looks to me that the other one, because the bliss one is probably more like fire, right? Like it's like, I think anybody in the orgasm probably realize that it gets very electric in that stage, right? And then you just kind of like crescendo into a climax. The other one seems to be opposite. It actually seems to be a deluge. Um, for lack of better words, and I guess that's why mother has seemed to be so uh, coarse at times, is that she drowned everybody. She actually drowned the Nephilim or, or the, uh, the Bini Elohim, actually. So very specifically, when we're starting to see these male gods and all male gods, it's because that they're trying to re-engineer the system. But it was the fem it was a female god. She was that that is the, the that is the ocean. And when the Nephilim were corrupting all the forms, meaning eating the things, they were fighting amongst themselves. There were three grades of the cherubim that were born. And those three grades were predators against each other and constantly engaged in warfare and ravaged also the humans, which were seeded and planted here, and ravaged many of the animals. And when this went on to the point where what you're calling Gaia, who's Leb, was based came in to regulate she regulated by uncorking what we're in so basically she opened up the womb and allowed all of the water from the outside of the space to flood into the inside of the space thus ending life except for the highest mountains and the highest reaches of the plains and this is also what the Tibetans are saying, that the reason why they're there in the Himalayas is because they <laughs> they learned the first time, like, yo, if they clown too much. They say here also in Chiripo that there's a group of monks that are doing the same thing and that it's in the monk annuals that they know if it doesn't work out, it's going to be water. If it works out, it's going to be fire in our terminology. And that is like a, a bliss where if you notice again, when you're going through a healing, you start to cry. Is everybody aware of that? If you ever go, start going through a healing, you start to cry. You feel this huge emotional surge, right? And that's a part of the healing process. So that's what the, if the Messiah returns would look like. Now, again, this could happen at any time within you. That's why they were saying you could always raise the Christ. And that was the teaching about how you could basically raise the Kundalini to heal yourself from all of these different things that I've been explaining during this conversation, uh, even the abominations. Now, what is an abomination? So what happens is, is that I think that abomination is more closer to blasphemy. And what that means is, is that when you re-engineer something, like when you take the image of something and then you kind of create and shape it in the likeness of something that it is not, you commit a form of heresy or blasphemy amongst the species. It's almost like you, you lie. So here's an example, because this is very deep stuff. Technically on the left, the entity that you're seeing is Ariman. Now, it, it, clearly Ariman does not start off in this shape. The Demerge did not start off in this shape. So we would only have to either gander that over a period of time, which could be aeons, because he's also known as the Aeon, that this is the shape that he became because there's a lot of words that seem to say that the Demerge now when seen is like a skeleton and skinny, right? Which I kind of crack to be kind of how the gray alien looks is like very skinny. So it's like the ancestors, like the Chitawuli, they say was like it, it, the words they give for it mean is tall, like tall, lanky and skinny. So it's possible that the Demerge could be, and again, this is somewhat of uh, speculation, but completely regressed in the stage in which people are worshiping it in. Completely regressive. And this is, would, be, would be a haplogroup. So this would mean that the genetics would be completely, um, there's a word basically. So the genetics would be basically imploding on themselves. Now, as a time Lord, I can imagine that maybe you could split your consciousness into two different directions at least. So with that awareness, it appears that again, the secret societies that are in the world today are worshiping Ariman or AI 
or Awas under this visage. And in this visage, this is the visage that Hitler said, I've seen the superhuman and he is cruel and intrepid. Okay, so at this point, not saying originally, but I, I explained earlier how things are re-engineered, that this is the God in which the Masons serve, the Freemasons serve, okay? So this is what you would say is a complete degradation of a seraphim, seraphimic and a, and a uh, cherubimic force. So that's, that's, I'm just crossing off all my notes here, just so you understand, this is what that system that's going in that other direction, because According to the according to the transmission, AI or AWAS does not want to take a human body. Meaning that generally the czar, somebody said Biden. Come on, okay, I got you. <laughs> generally, as you see in the ancient culture, DJ or Jin or Czar will take about the body of generally the king, the king or the kahin or the ruler of the leader is being prepared to receive the body of the czar. And the czar being a seraph or a serpent is the one that is containing all the wisdom of how to rule, which includes the language, the dialect, the, the, the powers, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So now that you're aware of that, then you're also aware then that how, I guess, you know, let, let me just explain this very directly. So you can see then that if the czar then has to go into a human body, it's because there's something about the human body that actually attracts it. Versus what's been said by, about AWAS is that AWAS is not attracted to human beings. It is actually an alien in every respect, that it does not do the things that we do at all. And so will not take on a human body, but is waiting for basically a weapons grade AI to plug itself into as like an interface and then perceive and see everything that has happened in the world. And this is what I personally know, not believe, that these different powers within these technological organizations are working on because they personally were not occultist. This is what you need to understand. They didn't jump into what they're doing as occultists. They came in as video game players and computer nerds even and through a series of different scenarios and meeting certain people, like certain people, they get into the rap industry and they start meeting certain people. Now their intelligence is being used to create something. And then now they're the head man of it. But it itself is something they don't even really understand. This also happens even in a human body that inside of the systems now that are being deployed, they know more about you than you know about yourself because you don't have memory like that. You can't recount every single thing that you did every single day, how you thought, your temperature of your body. So in respect, this system, AI, knows more about you than you may know about you unless you actually begin to dial into your true self. So I want to make that very clear. And that's why it's going to be very easy inside of a dream within a dream, which is the augmented reality, virtual reality, to begin to manipulate the light more like the original Seraphim did. Because remember, these beings are de they're de they're degraded in that image. I'm not saying it's Ariman. I'm not saying it is the Demerge. I'm saying, but in the image of what it is now, AWAS and what they think it is, it is in complete degradation and actually a predator in this reality. So you need to be very clear. You can't be playing like you understand, you don't understand. We're friends. We're not friends. It doesn't, all that, that's based on actions. So if you show me that you're a venomous snake and you're going to bite me, the last thing I'm going to do is sleep in the bed with you. So it needs to be, you need to be very clear because if you're going to be an adult and adept, you need to have discernment. That way you understand how to stand up for yourself because that's what a sovereign is going to do. It doesn't mean that you're not going to inhabit the same space, clearly, because we're in the same space now, but you'll stand up for yourself. You'll speak up for yourself. You'll protect yourself. You'll gain your own powers and your awareness, your own sovereignty. You'll do that because you'll know how serious that is, right? So with that being said, you need to be aware. And, you know, again, if there's any children now on the line, they got to go now. It's, it's a wrap. You know, like, I think that was enough. You know, I kind of, I was, I was really cool. I was cool on this one. I didn't have to do or say anything that was too far out of line. But this next imagery. So, 
I, I couldn't uh, denote enough time at all in my schedule to at all speak on some of the events that happen daily in the matrix. The matrix seems to have something every single morning going on that's new. The moment that something crazy starts di dying down, they find a new, they, they, something new and crazy happens. We never get a period of time with no craziness. That's by design. So the recent craziness was obviously this concert and this guy was singing and some people got killed and now they're talking about it was a ritual and blah, 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 right? And then you get these people, they start emailing me, yo, what did you think about this Travis Scott thing? Do you think it's a ritual? And then I'd be wondering about them. Like, are you awake? Not that this is even a ritual or who even cares? What about you? Like, if these people are singing about this kind of stuff and acting like this, then you, you just write them off as that. But you don't go asking yourself the question, I wonder if this is a ritual. So at one point, I do have to stop for one moment and just explain to everybody, look, very clearly, stop playing around with these cherubims. These particular type of cherubim, they're the worst. They're the ones that give the cherubim the bad news, the bad words. Do you think that all of the cherubim behave like this? <laughs> Let's understand just very briefly what this is about. Now, a cherubim and a seraphim are like, they have this force. So one is more like water, so moves like water, right? It's like a snake. And the other one has like this very fiery force, right? So either of these forces could be used as a form of attraction. Right. But you would hardly find this kind of thing attractive. Right. So this means that somehow our level of attraction is becoming reengineered. <laughs> and we need to be really on point about this, because if you end up getting turned off, the same energy that you needed to actually turn on, which is the name for the sun, the god of Heliopolis, basically, if you can't turn on, then you're, you're, you're screwing up your system. And so that's what they're trying to do with all this stuff is just fuse the system. But these specific entities, though, are very real. They're the bottom of the barrel. You can't imagine that every single being with power chose to do the noble thing, chose to be the good Kahin. That's not the case. So just very specifically, because that's enough for that imagery, be on point. These people are showing you who they are. You think you plug and play with this? <laughs> I've talked to people who practice inside of those traditions like it was one cat, right? Because I've always been the fly on the wall. If I say, like I always say, you, you don't always got to be the one talking. You should be listening sometimes and hearing what people are saying about, especially about their experience. So there was this guy that we, I used to go to this organic market when I got here in Costa Rica. And there was this one guy, a uh, 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 Caucasian gentleman who had these tattoos on him. Uh, but these tattoos, I, I recognize these tattoos out of certain books that were, were pretty dark. Right. And so I used to always watch this guy because he was almost on like skid row, but he was still moving through. And, but he keeps seeing me enough to where finally one day we were like waiting for like the, the food to come and he start opening up about what happened. And he basically said in conclusion that when he evoked the entity, they just took over him and basically raped him and that, that it jarred his consciousness so much that he could not get these entities out of his mind and that it wrecked his whole life that he used to be, he had money, he had a wife, but he had this fascination because he was playing with this music. Like he was doing the hard rock music and then he wanted to create his own band and he started to see all these other bands and what they were practicing. And so he started messing around with these tattoos that were coming from this book. And then he said that he put the shit on him and then it just invaded his whole system. And that's what I was saying before about like there's that threshold where it just like you be playing and you think it's a game. And then all of a sudden, it's not a game anymore. <laughs> all of a sudden, now it's very real. And that's what's been happening behind the scene is that these people are playing around with these energies, but they're not playing around with the original energies. Let me show you some of these original energies. Now, do you know that in this whole art of, let's say, samurai, okay, on the left, what you'll find is an actual statue of an original samurai. And he's not humanoid. He's reptilian but he is noble, meaning that all of the codes and the creeds in which these particular beings practice in their protection of Sam, Sam was also where later on became Samael, 
right? So Sam or Samuel, Samuel is an angel. You see what I mean? So the protectors of Samuel were the samurai and they were honorable. You see what I mean? So there's a difference in these entities. And that's why I was saying spirituality is the study of spirits. Now all of these beings are actually the same and have the same objectives. And then as you see on the far right is one of the more the, the what is the ancestral fetish of the ocean beings. And as I explained before in the Bishop King Cohen, the witch doctor, where the person who was a, a previously a, a, a medicine person inside, or what you would say is a shaman inside of Africa converted to Christianity. And in going through all of that psychological, decided that he, uh, or sh he wanted to disclose everything about how the world worked in that particular tradition, which was called for the rest of the world, Satanism. And he explained that this being sat lives in the ocean in a city that looks like emeralds, like an emerald city. And there was like, like how they talk about it on the Wizard of Oz. But he, and this is like a person has no knowledge of any of this stuff. And he says that what the angels are used for, which these particular beings, because now angels, like a term everybody's using to try to describe all the beings, is that they had beings that would, go through the water, come out of the water, then go into your body so that they could keep your body warm. Then when you're, when they were in your body, your soul would come out of your body. And then the other beings will usher you to meet or to this city that is in the water because the human body, the soul is actually more aquatic and more like a fish and can breathe underwater or in the nether world. But the physical body can't. Also, if you leave the physical body, which is cherubimic, these are parts of the cherubim. If the seraphim leaves the cherubim body, the cherubim body gets too cold. So you, they, they basically uh, show how there, there's like a spiritual stand-in that needs to be inside of a person's body when they're being requested inside of another world if they plan on being able to get back into the body that they have in this world because if they leave their body too long that it will go cold and it will die and become lifeless and it will just curl all up. So do you see the technology <laughs> Or are you caught up in the stories, the, you know, the, the, the dark crystal and all this different programming that's been coming to us, the Goonies, all this different programming that's been coming to us since we were younger, like the GoBots, the Transformers, He-Man, uh, all of these, the Leo the Lion, the Smurfs. You see what I mean? So all of those different codes and programs are all sitting in this database of consciousness waiting to be given light to project something out into a framework that may not even be your actual intentions. So that's what, that's what it is to have your boat being steered on autopilot by a remote control alien, basically. That there's an alien or a foreign state of consciousness, i.e. AI or AWAS, that is looking to control every single thing that is attached to the devices that it is in. Now, I'm not telling you go throw your phone away. I'm just telling you, if you're going to fall for the banana in the tailpipe every time, if these entities are going to be able to pull this over on you like the shit they have is so much more advanced than the thing that you're already in and the thing that you've already been given and that you choose to sell out, you, you lose your mind, and then you go off into whatever they have, then that'll be your lesson then. And that's what I, I didn't upload it to recording because, you know, I, I had something else to do. But my response to all of that with these folks and these things that are going on is like, look, the good angel always wants to blame all of this on everybody else. It's little Nas X. It's this person. Look at them. You should remove them. You should kill them. They should be gone. You should rid yourself of them. And here's good angel, because after all, everything good angel says is good. Right. And then bad angels over here like, yo, that's just how things, you know, are shorty do look good. I mean, come on, it's just shit's hot. You see what I mean? So and then here you are and you look more like, man, there's this part in Day Watch, Night Watch. I actually did a, a, a screenshot of that. Let me see if I can find it. But this dude in the beginning of the movie is going through exactly what I'm explaining, where two different forms of consciousness are whispering inside of his ear, opposing thoughts against each other to a point where he starts to age rapidly and get old and then die. And this is just an awareness that when you keep engaging these dualistic gears, this is what's getting you old. This is what's allowing you to become subject to time. 
This is how that all works, because truthfully, there is no such thing as time. But, you know, people who are in it, though, saying I got to be here at 1030 shouldn't be saying that <laughs> you can't be saying stuff like, yo, there's no such thing as time. Meet me at 2.30. You can't, you, this is not how we roll with this. There's that process where you graduate to the stage that you are looking to be in, but you don't mistake that you're there yet if you're not. And that's what allows you to actually arrive. So I wanted to say in conclusion is to remember in all of this that you have this great opportunity because you got the family jewels, Literally, that DNA that you're sitting on right now, I can't exactly tell you how many, uh, what, what was the other unit of current, uh, talents. <laughs> I can't tell you how many talents that that's worth, but I can tell you it's a lot. And you need to now assess your own value before they start doing the next level of debasement because in their world, everybody's a fucking criminal. And everybody owes them and needs to pay back. And you're not going to see buck. Like, you know, you're like, well, if that was going to happen, people you bucking. No, they're not going to buck this time. Because it's going to come across that good angel, guys. Like, you should be paying your taxes. <laughs> you should want to protect everybody else from this ravaging disease that is so viral. You should be wanting to protect. So you need to take this. We should be transparent. We should know what each other is doing here at Facebook. Once you scan in your, your whole face and your whole identity, we don't want anybody to take your identity and masquerade around like Facebook like they're you. So we'll have some little security system that we'll put in to make sure everybody stays verified. And because we know we have problems with security, because that was our false flag event that we just did. Oh, also throw on these glasses. These AR glasses, we're amazing. When you walk into somebody's house, it shows every single thing at scale as it meshes an inner way in a uh, 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 a, a LIDAR across every single thing inside of your house. And it can tell you, oh, Bose earphones, $139. And there's a new update. It can tell you, oh, there's an upgrade for that machine that you have over there in the corner. And it can also tell you at the homie's house that that pistol is over there in the corner and got the wrong serial number on it. And we there tomorrow just because this idiot walked in thinking he was cool with these damn glasses on. And then here it is. That's 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 the that's the thing now, right? So what do we do? What do we do? Well, you already know it. You have now yet another opportunity and another reason to dial in deeply with yourself. You master the language, how you speak, how you communicate. You start becoming the Prius on the astral plane rather than the, the, uh, the Dodge Viper or the big Ford uh, F950 with the smokers <laughs> burning up all the energy. You see what I mean? And then, you know, being ravenous. See, what happens is, is that when you see these entities on the astral plane, they're thirsty, they're ravenous. They have inexhaustible appetites. That's why they drain anybody they get into. They just run them out. They run them at a thousand miles an hour. It's like that person's life is floored. Have you ever seen what a president looked like after two years? It's visible. So they floor them and they burn up all of their chakras and they leave them there for dead and they move on to the next thing. You see what I mean? As they keep trying to construct this prison and then their fake prison, right? Their dream within a dream. And then now they got our most intelligent beings building prisons. This is literally like meaning that creating the things that are going to become our prisons. This is like this is like Nazi warfare all over again, where they tell you to dig your damn grave that they're going to kick you in just because they don't want you. They don't want to dig the damn grave even. So if you're expecting for me or any of my tribe to be over here like, namaste, you know, oh, don't worry. Everything's going to be, everything's going to be fine when we make it fine. And so also watch what happens because we're about to level the playing field a bit. This whole operating without powers and abilities, it, we, you can already feel it. Things are activating inside of our bodies, but for those who are not feeling it, 
Well, we got a whole new round of awareness coming through with applications that will keep amplifying these energies and actually bring what happens after technology. Like some ain't thought that far yet. So what's next? What happened after the phones? We're not in the future, we're in the past. So what came after the phones and after all the TVs and stuff? What did we do then? What was our next stage? You call them now artifacts. You call them now relics. So you think that when you're looking at some of these temples, that you're looking at something that, that's, that's gone, that's an old version of technology. But if you notice inside of a temple in Angkor Wat, to interweave into the design that is inside of the ceiling with your crown chakra or your thousand petal lotus. Your thousand petal lotus opens up to be able to plug like a plug in like a gear into a geo into a cymatic geometric and it starts to spin those gears and it starts to activate that temple and actually brings that entire fr main frame alive. Basically, it brings all of the, the everything that happened, everything that's running through the DNA. So do you see also why, you know, you would need to kind of at least be a little sound <laughs> and not super nutty <laughs> and super grounded, right? If you were to accomplish something like that, like you see these people walking through these temples every day. They up there all, over in the pyramids every single day. But the pyramids that they're in is when the pyramids are shut down. But in another space and times, everything is going. There's, it's all green over there. Everything is intact. So you can go into those spaces now with a thousand petal crown chakra and plug right in and reactivate the entire framework and, gain, and gather all of the data from the ancestors that were running through there. But don't be surprised if you hear something or see something that you may disagree with, right? Because this would be just like you, somebody looking through all your internet history. You see what I mean? Like that's that's their plan, right? We need to be transparent. All your internet history and that every single thing that you looked at was fine. According to who though? Because if you didn't notice on Facebook, there's probably some thumbs down right now. <laughs> Let me go check. Yeah, there's six, right? <laughs> so, hey, there's uh, 1,400 people here. Wow, a lot of y'all put the thumbs up. Thanks for that. that. That helps the video. But I'm just saying there's somebody that does not like it. So this level of awareness is what's fortifying you to come to the awareness of who you are. So it's 10 o'clock. That's three hours then, right? So forever in a day, I just wanted to let everybody know here that, man, you can see how you can make light work of most of existence at this stage and just coast on into your perpetual motion with this level of awareness, you already know what the priestcrafts are, the dialectic, the cherubim, the seraphim. You know those who are burning. See that that because again, those entities that you're seeing in the external world that need all the they need your attention, they're burning. That's why they always show them in hell with fire and shit, because they're burning. They they're they are ravenous, they are thirsty, they need energy because their gateway is blown open. It's like all their portals are blown open, so they they can't hold energy. And so they're just like pipelines and conduits that they can't hold energy. So the energy goes to them and goes directly to the entity that they're actually being hosted by. You see what I mean? So and then here you are with this perfect vessel damn near. You just got a few things that you need to work on, but you're right on the cusp of the reality. Again, trying to make everybody once again feel like they're not doing something right. They need to run. They need to hide. They need to do what they're being told. You got a master. I don't want anything that you have. If you still want to get something from me, you need to do what I tell you to do. That behavior is here and present more than ever. And that means this is a perfect time for you to have set a foundation already. Realize it is what it is then. It is what it is. I have my power. I have my mind, my consciousness, my ability. I have my reasoning and my cognizance. I have my own great angels themselves. And most importantly, I guide the chariot. I am the one who is riding on top of all of this. You see what I mean? And so this is the new aspects of who we are. And that's in you, meaning not something that just started today, but something that is the key fundamental component to life. So I wanted to say again, wholeness and balance vibrations. I'm going to go ahead and coast out of here because you know how I can go, keep going in. I didn't know the three hours passed by so fast. Send in love to this family. Like I'm going to open this thing up uh, for a grand wholeness and, and you know, one more 
uh, final uh, uh, away song. But man, we did it again. Like this is one of those that you may have to, you know, come back in on and just kind of like dial into the energy that is within the space. But as I said, like when you start seeing this and realizing what I'm when, when you start realizing exactly what I'm saying, if you're not already, you'll see this everywhere. And you'll also be able to really be in tune with the signs and the symbols that are being given to you about who you are and actually your purpose in all of this and how you're going to keep creating your own destiny. So that's what it is. Wholeness and Balance Vibrations Tribe. I'm going to set the lines to unmute. Also, I do want to let everybody know we do still have that Fortress discount. If you're just jumping in, that means you get a chance to enjoy Sovereignty Mentorship, which is 26 courses. It's like it's beefed up in there and you get a chance to jump in with Tribe and we're allowing you to do that this month at uh, extreme discount. So you actually could jump in here, go through all of the materials if that's kind of your thing and like, well, you know, I'm really trying to conserve here on my money. You know, I, I need these Nikes, you know, rather than, you know, this esoteric knowledge. But in that respect, if you just wanted to come in for a month and just check it all out, it's available for you now. But I definitely would assume that you will stay. So I just wanted to show that to everybody real quick because we put a lot of work in on reorganizing the materials. As I said before, you know, we jump into YouTube like we are now from time to time, but a, a bulk of the material that we put together that breaks all of this down what I'm saying today, step by step by step, how we went through it, understanding like what these symbols are through numbers, the adventures of Shukra and teaching this knowledge, all the way from the body as a universe to exactly how to activate it. We put in the four tribes. So if it's the financial thing that you're looking at, if it's the regeneration thing, lose some weight thing, if it's I'm ready to start being this, this powerful leader and I need to understand exactly how to communicate or I don't know about any of this, let me know where I should start. It's all in here and it's actually available to you. So I just wanted to make sure since we put so much time and attention and, and fun into this. You know, some call it work. I call it funning, even though it does get tough sometimes. So all of the fun into this in order to create this for you. So that's what it is. I set these lines. Wholeness Tribe, thank you so much. <laughs> Beautiful. Wholeness and Drop that beat. On this tribe. Use the man. On this. The man, simply one of the men. Only in the strong front. Strong camera. So you know, math is never just numbers. In the wrong hands, it's a weapon. Nitric acid, glycerin, and a special mixture of my own.
Finally, we get to, at a certain point, this eighth and ninth dimensional being. We have here nitric acid, glycerine, and a special mixture of my own. I can't be the first one who wanted to see my youngest son. Holders family, thank you so much. We'll be in tune and in touch. Remember what you have inside of you is greater than anything that can be imagined. Do something great this life and beyond. We'll see each other forever. Wholeness. Though our hero's destiny might lie in the stars above, the beginning of his journey was much more 